a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Jerry of the circus. Mr. Randall? Yeah? It's Major Mike, Mr. Randall. Are you busy? Can I see you for a minute? Oh, yes, Major. Come in. I'll only take a few minutes of your time, Mr. Randall. That's okay, Major. I was going over my books here, but they can wait. What's on your mind? Well, Mr. Randall, I, I don't know just how to start, but, well, I really come to talk to you about Jerry. Jerry? Well... You see, Mr. Randall, a boy's just about heartbroken not being able to work with that new elephant, El Mundo. Well, it's his own fault, Major. I must have discipline on the lot. But I don't think he had anything to do with cutting the bearded lady's beard off. I don't either, but I do think he knows who it was. Say, you don't happen to have anything to do with that beard-cutting job, do you? Who? Me? Why, Mr. Randall? Well, I happen to know you don't have a lot of love for the bearded lady. Well, she riles me. I uh, 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 even get mad thinking about it. Yes, I do. Well, then isn't it reasonable for me to suspect you of cutting her beard off? Oh, Mr. Randall. Uh, well, what is it you want to talk to me about, about Jerry? Uh, I wanted to ask you if you wouldn't let him go ahead and work El Mundo. He's got his heart set on it, and he was so excited about that uniform. I think he'd be a big attraction with the elephant. Uh, why this sudden interest in Jerry? Oh, I've always liked Jerry. Well, he's a great boy, but I can't have underhanded work going on. He's shielding someone, Major, and I don't like it. After all, he's working for me, and I'm paying him. If he's going to be loyal to anyone, I should be first. Well, but maybe he can't tell you. Nonsense. But if he feels that way, then let him take the punishment. Well, is that all, Major? You won't reconsider and let him work, El Mundo? No. I've got to find out who cut the beard off the bearded lady. Maybe Jerry will decide to tell me how he happened to borrow those shears from Clara. The best way to make a boy behave is to take something away from him that he wants badly. But, Mr. Randall... That was no prank, Major. What good's a bearded lady without a beard? She has no value at all now. At least until her beard grows out again, and that'll take months. Well, it serves her right. What's that? Well, it was her own fault, Mr. Randall. I, uh... I believe you know more about this than you're saying. Why, Mr. Randall... Now, listen, Major. If you know anything, I, I want you to tell me. You come to me pleading for Jerry. Now, if you really want to help Jerry, tell me all you know. If you learn who really cut the beard off, will you let Jerry ride El Mundo? Well, well, yes, I will. After all, that's what I want to find out. Well, you won't tell the bearded lady. I'm afraid you... You're afraid. You you promise you won't tell her. Well, all right, out with it. Who did it? Well, now, Mr. Randall, I hope you won't get too angry, Out with it, Major. Well, sir, I cut the beard off. Oh. Yes, sir. But she had it coming. Really, she did. Now, now, let me decide that. I'll tell you the whole story, and then I'll bet you'll agree with me. Well, it better be good. Well, in the first place, she'd been sending threatening notes to Carmen Bendini. She'd been threatening Carmen's life, Mr. Randall. What? She threatened to put acid on the tight wire the Bendinis used. 
In the last note, she said to Carmen had a dagger stuck through it. All right. She really had Carmen scared, and the Bendini brothers were going to take it into their own hands. Hmm. Well, that's bad, but uh, what did the bearded lady have against Carmen? She's jealous. That's what she is. Jealous? Well, jealous of whom? Well, I guess me. You? Because I've been paying a little attention to Carmen. Yes, sir. She said in one of those notes that if Carmen didn't get out of the circus right away, her life would be in danger. Is this the truth, Major? Positively, Mr. Randall. But why didn't you come to me? Why do you always take things in your own hands? Oh, I really couldn't help it. Really, I couldn't. I just got the idea that by cutting her beard off, I'd get even. It might scare her into behaving herself. I just got the idea, and the first thing I knew, I did it. And you went in and did your barber trick while she was sleeping? Yes, sir. Major, I don't know what to say to this. Threatening people, as she did Carmen, is bad. Very bad. Yes, sir. Folks that work on the wire are naturally high-strung and nervous. It's upset her plenty, Mr. Randall. Yes, I can well imagine. Well, what are you going to do with me? Now, Major, I, I'm i going to forget the whole thing. And you won't tell the bearded lady I did it? No, no, I won't. And you don't have to worry about her any longer, either. No? No, I've already let her go. She's leaving the circus this afternoon. You cut that beard pretty short, Major. Yes. She's of no value at all with her beard as short as it is. Is she going to join up with us again when that beard grows in? Well, I, uh, I haven't decided that yet. At any rate, she doesn't have to worry about money while her beard is growing in. She had it insured. What? <laughs> yes, she'll, she'll get a nice piece of money from the insurance company. Well, of all things. Yeah. Now, you will let Jerry work with El Mundo, Mr. Randall, will you? Well, <laughs> why, sure. <laughs> you know, Major... <laughs> I'm kind of glad this whole thing came to light. I won't have people around my show that send threatening letters to other performers. No, sir. Maybe without her beard, she'll cool off now. And this little vacation will give her a chance to think it over. Now, can I go and tell Jerry that you said it was okay for him to go ahead and rehearse El Mundo? Well, sure. Go look him up. Tell him I said to go over to Clara and tell her to finish up his uniform right away. Tell him to report to Olson and rehearse his tricks with the elephant. Oh, thank you, Mr. Randall. Jerry will sure be glad to hear this news. And thanks for being so easy with me. Yeah, all right, Major. But next time, come to me first with anything at all. I, I, I want to know about it first. You understand? Yes, sir. You're you're not to take anything into your own hands. Yeah, you know, you, you do some dangerous things when you get angry. Yes, sir. Well, all right, Major. Run along now and tell Jerry what I said. Well, goodbye, Mr. Randall. Goodbye, Major. Well, that was easy. Oh, won't Jerry be happy now to know how I fix things for him? Uh, hiya, Major. Oh, greetings, greetings. <laughs> you seem to be awful happy today. What happened to your usual grouch? I am happy, and what's more, I'm always going to be happy from now on. Oh, yeah? Now, nah, tut, tut, young man. Oh, say, have you seen Jerry around any place? Jerry? Yeah, Jerry Dugan. Oh, the boy. That's right. Have you seen him? Uh, well, yeah, he just cut across here a second ago. He was heading... Uh, there he goes now. See oh, him? Oh, yes, yes, thanks. Uh, hey, Jerry, oh, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> Oh, come here, Jerry. I got some good news for you. I got some good news for you. Everything is all fixed. What are you talking about? I just left Mr. Randall and I told him everything. I confessed to the whole thing myself. You did? Oh, gee, you're swell. Oh, Mr. Randall was very nice about it. and He told me to tell you to report to Olsen again and finish learning your tricks with El Mundo. You mean it? Of course I mean it. He told me to tell you to go right ahead with your rehearsing and said for you to go over to Clara and tell her to get busy on the uniform. You know, the one you're going to wear when you work the elephant? I, I can't believe it. Well, it's true, Jerry. I made a clean breast of the whole thing. And I told Mr. Randall you had nothing to do with it. And I thought you should be given a chance to work El Mundo. Oh, Major, that's keen. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Now hurry up and get over to Olsen and start learning your tricks with the elephant. But what about the bearded lady? Well, we won't have to worry about her any longer. How come? She's leaving the circus this afternoon. No fooling. That's right. Now run along and I'll tell you all about it later. Okay, and thanks again, Major. Come on, Ray. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, so long, Jerry. Oh, so long. Come on, Ray. <laughs> hurry up. <laughs> I'm going to be a performer after all. And... And I'll just bet I'll be good doing those tricks with El Mundo. <laughs> this way, Rags. In here in the menagerie. <laughs> Olsen! Olsen! Oh, here we are, Jerry. It, it's okay now. Huh? Oh, it's okay. I can work with El Mundo after all. Oh, what do you mean, Jerry? Well, Mr. Randall told me I couldn't work with him, and now he says I can. Oh. Claire is going to make up my uniform, and, and I'll be ready to work just as soon as I learn those tricks. Oh, <laughs> good. 
I was just trying to put this big fella through some of those stunts just now. Quiet, man. Now, you go lay down someplace and behave yourself. I'm getting very far with this foreigner, though. Well, haven't you learned your Spanish yet? Nope, and I guess it'll be a long time before I do. I ain't so quick to catch on to them funny lingos. <laughs> but Carmen told you a couple of things to say, didn't she? Oh, sure, I got them okay. It's a good thing, too, else I couldn't get this guy to do anything. Carmen is teaching me everything there is to say to him. <laughs> Hi, El Mundo. <laughs> oh, he knows his name. That's one thing. Well, what do I do first, Olson? Well, now, let's see. Well, how about getting up on his head this time? I'll, I'll get his foot up for you. All right, up. Oh, uh, uh, I say, El Mundo. Hey, hey look at him. He, he's putting it off. <laughs> now, grab a hold of his trunk and climb up. Like, like this? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Now, when he bends his trunk, sit on it. All right, now, now, quick, Gary. That's a boy. <laughs> hey, he, he's lifting me up. <laughs> oh, boy. That's it. Now, step over onto his head, but don't let loose of his trunk until you're sure you're up there. All right. Yeah, that's the way. <laughs> Good fellow, El Mundo. <laughs> I think you're beginning to understand a little English. Now what, Olson? Well, you'll just have to get used to it up there. I'll have him walk around with you a little bit. Um, um, a marshata, El Mundo. Hey, he's going. Swell, Olson. Yeah. He, what did you say to him? That's a new one. Oh, that's one of the words Carmen told me. Marshata means march. Hey, this is sure fun up here. Hey, he make him go faster. Won't fall off. Ah, I'm all right. Okay, then here goes the word for faster. Let's see now, how I say it? Uh, it's, uh, oh, yeah, uh, uh, rap, uh, rapido, rapido, El Mundo. Hey, that's good. <laughs> You're doing all right, too. Hey, it, it, it's sure rocky up here. I, I feel like I'm on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a boat. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you don't get seasick. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll start you over by the backyard so that all your friends can see you. Hey, go on back, Ray. Go away. <laughs> I guess your pup thinks the elephant's taking you away. <laughs> go on now, Ray. I'm all right up here. Go away. Go on. Go on, Ray. Famous. Famous, Ray. Famous. Hey, whoa, 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 Elmundo. Whoa. Hey, whoa. Hey, hey, Olsen, he's running away with me. Hold on, Jerry. You sure said the wrong thing that time, Jerry. Well, well, what do you mean? Uh, well, you said vamoose to rags, and El Mundo thought you meant it for him. Carmen told me that word, and it means to run. Well, stop him. Stop him, Olsen. How, how will I stop him? I, I can't remember what the word is. Cut, cut, El Mundo. Stop, quick. Whoa, whoa. Get Carmen quick. He, he's going faster. Yes, sir. Find out how to stop him, Olsen. Oh. Well, I'll go see if I can get Carmen, Jerry. Keep pulling on his ears, so he keeps pulling around in a circle. Uh, hurry, oh, get him oh, around here. Hurry, oh, all right. Would you hand me that, please? Thank you. 
Hmm. Now, let's see. Survey, survive, Susanna, suspect. Ah, here we are. Suspense, meaning held in doubt, expressing doubt, the state of being uncertain, undecided, or insecure, state of anxious expectation or waiting for information, such as uh, to keep one in suspense, therefore delay acquainting him with what he is eager to know. Suspense! An hour of suspense now. A full 60 minutes at this time. And with the distinguished actor-director, Robert Montgomery, as your host. Tonight, our star is Howard Duff, famous wherever radio is heard as Sam Spade, detective. And as Spade, he will appear in The Candy Tooth, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. This is Robert Montgomery. My pleasure and privilege it is to be here during this hour each week as a sort of guide, philosopher, and fiend. An accessory before and after the facts of crime and punishment, which calculatedly fill our minutes with suspense. This evening, before we chat a little about the private life of America's favorite private eye, let me, on behalf of Mr. Spear and all of us, thank you sincerely for your wonderful letters and telegrams expressing appreciation and interest in this new full-hour presentation. It's wonderful fun to have 60 minutes to play with in radio drama. In our new double-strength, king-size format, we plan to bring you radio plays based on complete novels and on theatrical productions and pictures. Many of the best writers of this literature, James M. Cain, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Graham Greene, Eric Ambler, and Agatha Christie have been happiest with a more spacious canvas upon which to display their characters of passion and purpose. With a full hour for our theater of thrills, we can give these authors a full stage on which to have their people play out their lusts and desires, their temptations and frustrations, their frantic fears and villainous triumphs, their descent into black and terror-laden bewilderment. Sometimes we find ourselves locked in the tortured brain of the scheming criminal. At other times... We know the dread of the hunted and hapless victim. But always the basic ingredient of suspense is not mechanical gadgetry, not the detectable piecing out of fingerprints and convenient clues, but always the basic ingredient is people. For people give us emotion, and emotion marks the high drama that cold logic can never achieve. Nowhere will you find stranger people, motives, and situations than those that pass through the door of a little office in San Francisco's Post Street. The lettering on the door reads, Samuel Spade, Private Investigations. Once it read Spade and Archer, but that was before Miles Archer stopped a bullet and plunged Sam Spade into the greatest detective adventure of modern times, the search for the Maltese Falcon. It was literally a shot heard round the world, for it brought into prominence the name of Dashiell Hammett and the so-called hard-boiled school of crime detection. Since then, the fictional private eye has become a national institution, but Sam Spade still rules the roost. In book sales, in motion pictures, the Maltese Falcon has been filmed four times now. And now on the air, every Sunday night, in The Adventures of Sam Spade, starring Howard Duff and produced by our very own Bill Spear. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce to our suspense audience now a young star from my home lot, Universal International, in the role with which he has become so closely identified that most of his fan mail is addressed to Sam Spade. Howard Duff. Thanks, Bob. I'd like to go on record right now as saying that any checks I may sign with the name Sam Spade will be accepted at your own risk. <laughs> the detective business has been pretty good lately, I hear. How much did Sam make during 1947? Uh, Effie would know. Ah. But no matter how much it was, it won't change Sam. He's, you know, he'll still do business at the same old stand in a rickety office building on Post Street where the elevator seldom ever works and the janitor never ever works. As a matter of fact... I got into my Philip Marlowe pants this morning and did little spade work on spade myself. Mm -hmm. Don't stop me if I'm wrong, but here are some of the facts. F-A-X facts. Mm -hmm. The way I dug them up. Age? Nobody talked. History? Mysterious, but was probably a Pinkerton man to start with. Height? Six feet and a small chunk. Weight? Enough muscle to go with his height. Hair? Dim out blonde. Eyes? Yellow gray. Unmarried. Lives alone in a small furnished apartment within walking distance of his office is economical to the point of, uh, well, never takes a cab where streetcars can get, and has been known to walk where they can't get. Secretary, Effie Perrine, the only person who really knows what makes Sam tick when he wants her to. Otherwise, he's a lonely man who trusts no one, lives alone, and loves alone, and expects others to like it. Have I left anything out? 
Uh, nothing you left out, Bob. Something you put in. It's not true that I don't trust anybody. I trust everybody. All my clients are honest until I prove them otherwise. Maybe that's what's kept you in the private eye business all these years. <laughs> that and the strong hatred that I have. Hatred? Yeah, for time clocks and the hours between nine and five. That's why I went into business for myself, and that's what keeps me there. Then you regard it as a business, Sam, and not as an adventure. Hmm? Well, when you break an arm in an adventure, the cost of setting it is not tax deductible. In a business, it is. Yes, I see. How many cases have you had? And do you think all private dicks are clever? Well, uh, I've had so many cases I can't remember them all. Uh, about being clever, I once knew an operative who, uh, looking for pickpockets at Santa Anita Racetrack, had his ward stolen. He uh, later became a lieutenant of detectives in Glendale. Sam, tell me, what was the most surprising thing that ever happened to you? The most surprising thing that ever happened to me was in 1936 in Washington, D.C. I met a young lady on a bus who did not remark that my work must be very interesting. Well, that's very interesting. Thanks a lot. <laughs> but I guess my most exciting caper since the Maltese Falcon was the hugger-mugger over the candy tooth. Usually when I wind a caper, I call Effie just to let her know I'm okay before I hustle down to the office to dictate my report to the client. But this time, it was 4.30 in the morning before I could get to a phone. The reason was that I was in jail. Hello, State Detective Agency. Wake up, Angel. You're home in bed, not at the office. Mm hmm. What time is it? 4.30 in the morning. Are you all boys? Effie, pull yourself together. Get dressed. Hustle down to the city jail. Oh, city, what happened? Well, that's what I got to get on the record now while I'm still alive to do it. Grab a taxi and hustle on down. Bring a book, pencils, the encyclopedia that has the letter K in it, and any old $20,000 you got laying around. Hey, where am I going to get pencils at this Just as fast as I could. There was no taxi left. What are you doing in jail? My apartment's being redecorated. Did you bring your book? Oh, of course I did. And pencil, too. But you're here on a murder charge, Sam. Whatever could have happened Take it down, Effie. But, Sam, what did the you San do? The San Francisco Homicide Bureau. Attention, Detective Lieutenant Dundee. Date, uh, fill it in. I will. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the candy tooth caper. Dear Dundee, I don't know all the answers, not yet. What I do know is going down on paper while I'm still alive to get it there. Okay. The scenario runs something like this. This morning, a telegram came to my office. It was addressed to Samuel Spade, Esquire, and it was signed, Casper Gutman. Gutman, the fat man. So far as I knew, Dundee, when you closed your books on the Maltese Falcon Capers seven years ago, Gutman was entered as dead. First, I thought the telegram was somebody's idea of a joke. But when I read it through the second time, I knew it was no joke. There's nobody else who thinks or talks or writes like Casper Gutman. My dear Mr. Spade, you will no doubt receive with mixed emotions the news of my imminent reappearance in the city of the Golden Gate. Hence the companion dispatch of a telegraphic draft in the amount of $1,000, which you are free to convert into coin of the realm. This trifling sum, sir, is merely a token of my esteem for a man of many resources and nice judgments. And for it, I do not require any specific service. However, if you feel so disposed, sir, you are free to accept my considered advice in the matter of an invidious pair of rogues. To wit, one Lawrence Laverne, DDS, and or Hope Laverne, whose charms and aliases are far too myriad to enumerate in this necessarily abbreviated communication. Should either or both of these persons approach you, Beware the hidden truth. Believe me, sir, they are untruthful, unreliable, and totally devoid of all moral sensibility. I count upon you to make no commitments to them or anyone else until you have heard my proposition. This I hope to lay before you when I arrive in San Francisco this very evening. Dear Joe, send regards. I remain your obedient servant, Casper Gutman. Casper Gutman, the fat man. I know, Dundee, you figured I didn't get hurt much the last time I tangled with Gutman over the Maltese Falcon. But that's because you didn't know Bridget O'Shaughnessy as well as I did. As well or as warmly. Well, I figured if Gutman was still in the land of the living, let him come. This time I wasn't going to get hurt in any way. There couldn't be two Bridgets. Nevertheless, I ate a can of spinach, which I found on Effie's desk. Then I sat down again, facing the door. Nothing much happened for almost ten minutes. 
I was still trying to dig the meaning out of Gutman's double talk, and I'd gotten about as far as his warning about a hidden tooth when Effie ushered a man into my office. Mr. Spade. Well, well, I must say that you are indeed a pleasant surprise, but pleasant. You've said it. What can I do for you? My name is Laverne. Larry, uh, Lawrence Laverne. How do you do? I shall spare you the tasks and details and plunge right into the problem. Oh, dear. At the Hotel Royal George, there is a mildewed creature, in, but mildewed, registered as Mr. Herman Julius. Oh, a really frightful person. Very frightful, huh? Oh, the kiss of death department. The only thing about this creature that has any charm is the four-toothed lower bridge in his right jaw. Now, Mr. Spade, I want you to get that bridge for me. I'm sorry. It sounds as though you're saying I want you to get that bridge for me. Precisely. Mm-hmm. Why? Because he refuses to pay me for it. You're uh, a dentist? I prefer to regard myself as a dentist sculpture. I created this bridge for Mr. Julius with infinite pains. And now, now he refuses to pay me. I ask payment and he accuses me of acting without charm. Mr. Julius wouldn't happen to be a very large, fat man. Oh, contraire. Skin and bones. Well, Mr. Spade? I'm afraid you come to the wrong man, Mr. Laverne. What you want is a lawyer to sue him. Sue him? Months of legal wrangling? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I intend to be vindictive about this. I am by nature a very gracious and charming person. But now, now let him beware. I shall have that bridge from Herman Julius, even if you must knock him down and wrench it from his jaw. Uh-huh. You tried knocking him down yourself? Oh, I, I could never even bring myself to perform extractions. I always send those patients to less sensitive dentists. Yeah, well, I'm afraid you'll have to find yourself a less sensitive private detective. Oh, oh dear. Well, Mr. Spade, what would you advise me to do? I, uh, Mr. I... Laverne, I would advise you to get out of California before Walt Disney sees you. Well, well, good day, sir. Hmm. I would like very much to have you in my chair someday. Oh, I might teach you some manners. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Beware the hidden truth. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> Please sit down, Miss... Uh... Thank you. Laverne. Hope Laverne. Miss Laverne? Yes. What can I do for you? Well, I'm, uh... I'm looking for my brother. Missing? Well, yes, yes and no. I mean, he's been gone since yesterday, and I'm terribly afraid he'll get into trouble. Oh? What kind of trouble? Well, you see, it... it... But it just isn't easy for me to talk about this, Mr. Spade. Well, now, Miss Laverne, suppose you just lean back in that chair, close your eyes, and... Yes, thank you. Yes, it's easier like this. Mm-hmm. I thought you'd like My brother's name is uh, Lawrence. He's a man of 52. He's uh, he's not well. I, I mean, he, he gets spells, and he acts peculiarly. He suffered a nervous breakdown some years ago, and he spent most of his life in sanitariums. Where are you from, Miss Laverne? Kansas City. Uh, during the past year, uh, Larry was in a rest home in uh, Palo Alto, and I arrived two days ago to take him home. Yesterday morning, he... Well, I don't know how it happened, but he's gone. These uh, spells you mentioned, what are they like? Oh, well, he assumes different personalities. His favorite seems to be that of a dentist. He becomes obsessed with the thought that he's done some work, a bridge or something, for someone who refuses to pay him. He'll walk up to a perfect stranger and create a scene. He's been arrested a few times, nothing serious, public nuisance. Mr. Spade, I'm afraid that he'll be... he'll be put away if he's arrested once more. I see, and you want me to look for him. Then he hasn't been here. Why'd you think he'd come here? Oh, that, that's another one of his tactics. He goes to a private detective, hires him to either follow a man or get back the work he thinks he's done. Uh, uh, dental work, you know. But what made you think he'd come to me? Oh, well, not you, particularly. Ever since yesterday, I've tried almost every private detective in San Francisco. No one has seen him. Who'd you talk to? I beg your pardon? These uh, private detectives, who'd you see? Oh, well, um, um, there was a man named Graham and um, uh, one named Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. Excuse me. Would you like a drink? No. Marlowe speaking. That's uh, Spade, Phil. Hiya, Sam. Uh, Phil, uh, you got a rumble on a missing brother named uh, Larry Laverne? Yeah, yeah. Gal was in early this morning. Hmm? Brother's some kind of a screwball. You meet him? No, no, hasn't been around yet. Ah, uh, thanks, Phil. See you. Why did you do that, Mr. Spade? It's doing things like that that have kept me alive and in business all these years. That was Marlowe. Your brother hasn't been to him. I told you that. But your brother has been here. When? A few minutes before you came in. 
Can't see how you missed him. What did he tell you, Mr. Spade? Pretty much as you outlined it. About the dental work. And some man owing him money. Yes, yeah, some man named Julius. Uh, Herman Julius, he said. You know him? I never heard of him. He's probably just another figment of Larry's imagination. Mr. Spade, I'm terribly worried about Larry. I got that impression. Will you try to find him for me? Can you give me any idea where I might start looking? Well, I, I, I think I know how Larry's mind works when he's in the midst of one of these spells. And uh, if you find this Mr. Uh, uh, Julius, uh, you'll probably find Larry close by. So you want me to find Mr. Julius first? Oh, well, I only thought it would be simpler checking on this Mr. Julius' movements than on Larry's unpredictable whims, you see. I... Don't you think that makes good sense, Mr. Spade? Miss Levine told me she was staying at the Pickwick Arms, and I said I would call her if I found her brother, and she said, thank you, thank you very much, and I said, it's nothing, just part of the day's routine, and then she kissed me and left. After lunch, I uh, strolled over to the Royal George Hotel. Duke, the housekeeper, gave me a rundown on Mr. Julius, a quiet, nervous little man who'd sealed himself up in his room for two days, eating out of room service. I didn't have any trouble finding the hacky who had driven him away when he checked out. He gave me the address, and 20 minutes later, I was mounting the front steps of a greasy rooming house on Sacramento Street. I twisted the rusty bell in the door, and a long, sharp nose that could only belong to a landlady stabbed out at me. What do you want? I'm looking for a man named Herman Julius. Don't have no Julius here. Well, maybe he gave some other name. A little skinny guy with a foreign accent. You the Lord. Take me to his room. Wait, no, wait a minute. Now, no. Well, step inside. Upstairs. Hey, home? Never seen him go out. Ain't for one door. Watch that step second from the top. It's busted. Don't want no lawsuits. It's the third. Said he was a refuge. The Nazis were after him. Uh, another fight. Never knew he was in a dangle with the Lord. Uh, smell that? Certainly do. Cooking in the room. Oh. I got a rule, too. Sneaking electric plates, they do. Runs up the bills. Buzzards. Uh, there's his room. Uh. Mr. Julius! Uh. Mr. Julius! Uh. Mr. Julius, you sick of that? Uh. They drink some of them. Them that don't cook in their room, they uh, drink. Get D.T. some of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, go on in and get him. I don't want no part of it. Uh, oh, they say. I didn't see who it was right away. His face was the color and consistency of crushed strawberries. I helped him up and over to the wash basin in the corner of the room. With his face washed, he looked a little better, but he still looked like Larry Laverne. Oh, oh am I ever glad to see you. I thought it was them coming back to kill me. Did you find Julius? No, no. Got away with the wretch. Down the fire escape as I came in. Who did this to you? A big fat man? Oh, to tell the honest truth, Mr. Spade, I, I never even got a good look at him. He was all over me before Where's I... Where's Julius? Had... What's in his bridge work? Oh, I'll tell you everything. Everything. But please, first, let's get out of this horrid room. Oh, smells like Abby. <laughs> Larry Laverne was tougher than he looked. After the going over he'd gotten, you or I would have been hospital bound, Dundee. But he did a late take. We were on the way back to his hotel, walking toward market. When he crumpled in the middle like a sack of flour, I grabbed him and held him upright, looked wildly around for somewhere to park him. We were standing in front of a newsreel theater. I bought two tickets and piloted him inside. We sat down. I undid his clutch in my arm and concentrated on the screen. The subject that followed the football game was some big Oriental celebration somewhere in India or someplace. A very fancy parade with white elephants. Candy, chill on. The, the famed white elephants oh, no. of the Orient get their annual airing as crowds of devout Buddhists oh. gather to do oh. homage to some of the strangest relics in the modern world. Here in Candy, oh. the mecca of the Buddhist religion, pilgrims gather oh. from near and far. Indian Rajah, oh, Burmese please. officials, and Very Chinese quiet. dignitaries oh. in ceremonial dress prostrate themselves before the jewel casket containing the most sacred object of the Buddhist world. Uh, legendary relic of Buddha himself. <laughs> as the Orient goes wild in jubilant uh, celebration, temple dancers uh, of candy perform for the crowned heads of the Orient. Take me out of here! I can't stand it, Uncle Man! I tell you, shark raving man! It's easy, you're annoying the customer. You brought me in here on purpose. You're trying to drive me crazy, but crazy! Easy, easy. Listen to me. Two men if holding up the sacred relic are high street. priest. If that man says that one word, Candy, just once more, I won't be responsible, I tell you. I won't be responsible. All right, Larry, Take me out of here. What the 
again. Oh, you got me, Tony. Come on, let's get out of here. ceremony, indeed. Oh, I promise you, Mr. Spade, all I need is just one night's sleep and I'll be a new man. Yeah. Well, I haven't even dared to take 40 winks since I arrived in this town for fear those monsters might murder me in my bed. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh. It's tough. Sit down. So this is your apartment? That's what I laughingly call it. Living room, bedroom, ice box. Here, have a drink. Me oh, too. Oh, thanks. Oh. Oh, did I ever need that. Help yourself with the bottle. I don't touch alcohol as a rule, but after what I've been through... Well, now, drink all you like. You deserve it. Oh, thank you. Ah. Well, I hardly know where to begin. It's also strange. And there I was in Lisbon, Mr. Spade, the only English-speaking dentist worthy of a name in the entire diplomatic colony. Well, you must have read in the papers about Don Constantino's tomb being violated. It was the scandal of the season. Oh, it's so, so horrible, Mr. Spade. I just can't ah, talk hey, about hey, it. Hey, hey. I more of this. Settles the nerves. Oh, I just don't know how I can ever thank you. Ever since I hit this berg, I've been feeling like the forgotten... <coughs> Pardon, man. Yeah, you were saying something about a tomb being broken into. In Portugal, this was? Yes. Well, you know, the draft board just took one look at me and... I know what you mean. So I just stayed on in Lisbon. And, well, you know how people gossip, having patience of all nationalities and all that. Yeah, know. yeah, I get it. Between the Nazis and the Allies, you were quite a social line. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't get the idea I was a spy. Oh, no. But sometimes people had things that could be hidden in a hollow tooth and like that to bridge work, you know... I think I told you I'm not so much a dentist as a dental artist. Mm -hmm. Well, that fat Mr. Gutman brought me this tooth, you see. Gutman? Yes, yes, Mr. G and that Joel Cairo person that was with him. Well, they brought me this tooth. Oh, a horrid yellow old thing, practically a fang. They wanted to put it in Mr. Julius Bridge. Paid me a thousand pounds, can you imagine? Then when I learned what they had done, well, it made me positively ill. This practically sacred old tomb in the cathedral, they'd broken in and literally torn out a piece of his, of his jawbone. Whose? Why, Don Constantino's. And who's Don Constantino? Oh, the Portuguese viceroy. It didn't hurt him any. He's been dead 500 years if he's dead a day. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm as tight as a tick. <laughs> this, this nigger is getting to me. <laughs> And it was. I thought he'd open up some more, but I overplayed the bourbon. Half a bottle later, he passed out. I flopped on the sofa and tried to get some sleep for myself. But my dreams kept getting in the way. I had newsreel dreams and technicolor. I dreamed that a white elephant with a face like Casper Gutman was leading a parade down Market Street. The howdah that was strapped to his back looked like a dentist chair. Herman Julius was sitting in it, but this face seemed to be blanked out. Joel Cairo, wearing a surgeon's gown and a turban, was drilling Julius's tooth. The crowds were throwing diamonds and rubies from the peanut bags they were carrying, and Gutman vacuumed them up with his trunk. That was when the bells started ringing in the Buddhist temple that had been built on top of the Mark Hopkins. Who's this? Oh, Laverne, please, Mr. Spade. I'm, I'm terrified. Where are you? I'm in a drugstore, Fifth and Mission. You're the bus depot? Yes, please, come at once, Mr. Spade. Well, can't you come here? I can't. I don't dare go into the streets. All right, wait there. I'm on my way. I took a quick gander at Laverne, saw he was still out cold, slipped into my top coat, and left the apartment. I figured it would take me 11 minutes to hustle over to Fifth and Mission. I never got any further than 50 yards from the front of my building. I sensed him behind me, wheeled suddenly, bumped him into a doorway, held the thumbs of his hands, gripped tightly in my fist. Oh, stand still or I'll tear him off. Let go. I'll kill you. Don't no, move and it won't hurt. You filthy beast. The boy twisted suddenly and violently, and I heard the crack of his left thumb breaking. He swallowed a scream, dashed down into the deserted street. I went after him, turned over the alley, and caught the butt of a gun behind my right ear. I don't know how long I was out, but I do know I came to at least three hours too soon. I needed much more rest. I opened my eyes, 
steady the swaying ceiling. And then I heard his voice. Well, sir, this is indeed a jolly reunion. <laughs> Couldn't be, but it was. Casper Gutman, the fat man of the Maltese Falcon Caper. Looking at the unholy trio there in the room, Joel Cairo, the little Levantine, still as oily and smiling as ever and still fragrant. Marvin, a sullen, white-faced, hollow-eyed youth as near Wilmer's double as anyone will ever see. And Gutman, spruce as ever in his black cutaway coat, black vest, and gray striped, gray striped trousers. You'd have thought nothing had happened since then. Not even the war. The grayness of Cairo's temples only made his baby face look more babyish. And about Gutman, nothing was different except his watch chain. A curious jewel-encrusted ornament dangled from it, shaped like a claw. Uh, you seem surprised to see me, sir. And no wonder. It's always disconcerting to encounter a ghost, especially such a substantial ghost. <laughs> A lot of water has gone under the bridge since last we met, eh? Under the bridge? Uh, yes, which brings us to the subject at hand, the bridge. My headaches. What about the bridge? Uh, first, we'll talk a bit. After all, this is quite an occasion, sir. Reunion of old friends, eh, Mr. Spade? Yeah. Tell me, did you ever find the falcon, if you'll excuse the expression? Oh. Uh, your eyes are resting on all that remains of that fabulous bird, sir. Yes, that trinket on his watch chain. All the remains of the Maltese falcon. We'll mark you, sir, what part of it survived. The claw. Uh, you believe in omen? Right now, I'm ready to believe almost anything. Indeed, sir. Well, no need for dissembling. We're old and wise, I trust, and in the days of the falcon. Well, suffice it to say, the unsavory and uh, bloated object which the police dredged up from San Francisco Bay and identified as myself was some other poor soul. Wilma, I am happy to say, remembered the debt of gratitude he owed me, and at the last moment agreed to be a party to the very necessary little deception. That is... Since they had him cold, as you detectives say, for the other killings, he might as well confess to murdering me. He did so in exchange for my agreement to take care of his family in a financial way. An investment, by the way, which has paid rich dividends. How's that? Oh, indeed. Oh, well, thanks to it, I now have Marvin, Wilma's younger brother. I thought I noticed a family resemblance. Oh, shut up! Oh, yes, yes, poor Wilma. He was like a son to me, like a son. Well, it didn't stop you from making him a patsy. I detest killing Mr. Spade. I cautioned Wilma time and again. He was so headstrong. Oh, mere boy. You better caution this punk or he won't last to take any raps for you. Oh, break his head, Marvin. Marvin. Oh, that dirty shamus lays not a hand on me. Oh, no, 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 Marvin, Marvin. Go, take Marvin into the other room. Explain to him that Mr. Spade and I are very old friends. Yes, for knows best, Marvin. Come with me. And now, you. no nonsense, you two now. Oh, I'll kill him. Yes. Marvin, yes. Marvin. Yes. Yes. would be angry. <laughs> oh, dear. Hot headed. Runs in that family. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's have it, Gutman. What are you after this time? Oh, my dear boy, you must judge me. It's true I had Marvin check up on you, but only because of your association with Miss Laverne. Oh, uh, no matter now. I'm weary of the chase. All the way from Candy, I... <clears throat> what did the girl tell you? She asked me to find her brother, a dentist named Laverne. You believed her story? No. Most unscrupulous woman. No veracity, no regard for truth whatsoever. A true motive? <laughs> Merely to make trouble for me and my friends because of her association with Kemidov. Aye, the Russian's hand again, Mr. Spade. Kemidov. Did I ever meet Kemidov? You'd hardly forget if you had. In short, here is my proposition. Another thousand dollars, coin of the realm, sir, for which you will refund whatever money Miss Laverne gave you and send her packing. The bidding starts at ten thousand. Ooh, ooh. You drive a hard bargain, Mr. Spade. <clears throat> Very well. I'll meet your terms. I told you the bidding starts there. And where does it stop? Half of whatever the caper nets you. I deliver Julius, you do the rest. Well, between you and me, Mr. Spade, I'm not as affluent as I once was. The Falcon pretty well wiped me out financially. Considering the time and money I've already invested in trying to track down the weasel Julius. Sir. What's in uh, Julius's bridge work? <laughs> and if I don't choose to tell you? Then it's no dice. Think it over, Gutman. Either I'm in all the way for half, or I deliver Julius to the other outfit. And that is your final dictum, sir? Take it or leave it. Either you're in or you're out. <laughs> well, good night, Mr. Spade. I trust you will call me on the telephone when you reach your diggings and tell me that you've changed your mind. <laughs> no, no hard feelings. <laughs> the fog was clearing, and only a few white wisps of it were clinging to Twin Peaks when I walked home that morning. It was too late to worry about hope. Or did she phone for Gutman to decoy me out so that I started walking faster? The 
As I climbed the stairs to my apartment, I heard a door open on the landing, and the slot of light that stabbed out from it showed me it was my door. The light came from behind, whoever had opened it, and I couldn't see who it was at first, only that it was not Larry Laverne. I took the last flight four steps at a time. Hello, Sam. Dundee, what's happened? Come in and see for yourself. When I saw for myself, I wish somebody else had seen for me. Hysterical Larry was lying on his back on my bedroom floor. His eyes were wide open, and he had a crooked grin on his face. A very crooked grin. Whoever had killed him had wrenched his jaw out of place. I'm not saying you killed him, Sam. I'm only asking you who did. Don't be a child, Dundee. Why was he killed? No statement. What was he doing here? Who is he? The name he gave was Laverne. I let him flop here because he's afraid to go home. Afraid of who? A man named Casper Gutman. What? Yeah, Gutman. Quit stalling, Sam. Gutman's dead and you know it. You bury him, Dundee? Well, I believe you mean it. Where Gutman's concerned, it doesn't pay to kid around. What's he after now? The bridge work out of a man's mouth. The man's name is Julius. What's in this Julius bridge work? Maltese Falcon? Something like that. I'm sorry, Sam. It's not good enough. I'll have to take you in. So you took me and you booked me. Bail was set at $20,000. You saw to that. You figure there's only one operator who'd put up that kind of money to spring me, and that's Casper Gutman. I hope you're right. Period. And the first part, at least, of Sob Story. But Sam, what is in Herman Julius's bridge work? Well, Laverne told me it was a tooth Gutman stole out of a skeleton in an old Portuguese catacomb. What's so valuable about that? I don't know. Could be a jewel inside of it? No, it's not Gutman's kind of game. Besides, the thing that made poor Laverne blow his top in that newsreel theater was something more like an elephant tusk. Oh. Uh, where's that encyclopedia? Did you bring it? Oh, yes, I did, Sam. Yes, I did. Wasn't I smart? Look it up. Look what up? Candy with a K. Oh. Um, K, K, can. Oh, here it is. Um, candy. Hey, nothing. City. Capital of Central Province of Ceylon. Located near the center of the island north. Spare me the geography. Well, the railroad from Colombo. Uh, noted for its waterfalls and stuff and stuff and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. That is, the city surrounds an artificial lake. And is sacred to Buddhists for a temple of Monigawa, which enshrines the tooth of Buddha brought according to legend. Why? Let me see that. Yes, let me see. Uh, the sacred, the sacred to Buddhists for its temple of Monigawa, which enshrines it. Effie. What's the matter, Sam? The tooth of Buddha. Sam, you don't think that's what's in Herman Julius's bridge work? If it was, Gutman would be after him. But how did he get to Portugal? If it did, Gutman's the man that could track it down. Sam, you sure of that? No, Angel. No. The only thing I am sure of is this. When the Maltese falcon laid an egg, it hatched a flock of vultures, and they're all circling right around my head. Well, cheer up, Sam. You won't be in jail long. I'll bring you a cake with a file in it. Angel. No. Devil food. In tonight's full hour of suspense, Howard Duff, our star, appears as Sam Spade with Joseph Kearns as Casper Gutman in William Spears' production of The Candy Tooth. Tonight's study in Suspense. In just a moment, we will return with the second half of The Candy Tooth. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, back to our Hollywood soundstage and Robert Montgomery. At the point at which we interrupted Sam Spade's narrative just now, things were at a pretty pass. A pretty pass, indeed. A pretty pass. Sam wound up with the body of the dentist, Larry Laverne, in his apartment. The girl, Hope, waiting for him in the bus station. Casper Gutman, the fat man, waiting for him to answer, and waiting for an answer to his ultimatum that Spade produced the tooth, or else... Me in city prison on a $20,000 bail, and the fabulous candy tooth still chumping on two-bit hamburgers and the bridge work of a very elusive man named Herman Julius. Yes. And? Well, uh, after I dictated my report to Effie on what had happened until then, she left and I laid down to think. Lieutenant Dundee and I had agreed that I should spend the night in the pokey. He figured that the 20G bail would draw only one man to put up that much moolah to spring me, Casper Gutman. Along about 9 in the a.m., the turnkey unlocked the door of my cell. I followed him out to the desk. The 20,000 bucks were there, but no sign of benefactor, benefactress, or Samaritan of any type. The bond was in my name. I signed my release and walked out. Across the street was parked a long black limousine with the curtains drawn. 
I started for it when a voice at my elbow checked me. Just send your spade. See. Si. Uh, I'm Dom Constantino de Braganza. It's I who have put up the $20,000. Is that so? <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, now, uh, why? Uh, I desire a service. <laughs> my card, Senor. Uh, Dom Constantino de... Wait a minute. Yes, you seem to know the name, eh? Yeah, yeah. For a guy who's been dead 500 years, you don't look too bad. <laughs> oh, thank you. You are referring, of course, to my illustrious ancestor, Dom Constantino, the first Portuguese viceroy of India, who indeed had been dead since the 16th century. It's on his behalf I speak to you now. What can I do for him? Restore the tooth which was wrenched from his skull by a pack of unspeakable ghouls who violated his tomb in Lisboa. You think they're in San Francisco? Let us not be naive, Senor. The contemptible little dentist, Laverne, was killed in your apartment. Therefore, you must know the whereabouts of the other ghouls. I know so many ghouls, Senor. You'll have to be more specific. I refer to a fat pig named C. Gutman and an odorous little camel named J. Cairo and most especially to a woman of the female sex by name H. Laverne. You want them or the tooth? Both. Not one without the other. No, it'll take a little time. They haven't got the tooth. You know what it is? In the bridge work of a man named Julius. Oh. That then explains the dentist and the diabolical manner which they employed in smuggling the tooth out of his Now, uh, you hey. go on home and uh, you stay there until I call you, huh? Ah. Thank you I respect your judgment. Thank you. You will find me at the Hotel San Rafael and for the retainer... You may consider the $20,000 bond as due. Well. Adios, senor. Adios. Uh, be careful crossing streets. Uh, adios. 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 Adios, Tom Constantino. Adios. Yeah, adios. Adios. Adios, Sam. Uh... Hey, Sam, get in. You, uh, got a hack license, Miss Laverne? Oh, please don't, Sam. I know this car's ridiculous, but I don't dare use taxis or be seen on the street. What did that man tell you? What happened last night when you called me from the bus station in such a panic? Why didn't you come? I went to see the fat man. You saw Gutman? Did he mention me? You didn't make that call last night to get me out of the apartment so that somebody could get in and kill Laverne. Oh, Sam. Then why did you call? Because I found Herman Julius. And I'm driving you there now. We didn't do any talking after that. She sat very close to me. There was plenty to talk about, but we didn't do any talking after that. I was vaguely aware that we were driving across to Oakland, and a few minutes later, we pulled up in front of an apartment building. We took the elevator up to the ninth floor. This is it, Sam. 9B. Nobody home. Oh, he's in there, Sam. I know he is. Mr. Julius. Mr. Julius. Go away. There's no Julius here. That's his voice. Mr. Julius, I've got to talk to you. It's very important. If you don't open the door, I'll have to... I'll kill myself. I'll kill myself. He will, Sam. He will. You've got to stop him. Go away. Julius. Wait a minute. Wait. Don't. Don't. It was the ninth floor he started from. Poor, frightened little Herman Julius was dead on arrival. By the time we made it downstairs, the street was cluttered with cops. I grabbed Hope by the arm, hustled her around the corner to a rented limousine, and told her I'd call her later. My next stop was the fat man himself. Well, sir, so you reconsidered. You found Julius. I know where he is. And your turn, sir. What are your terms? A hundred thousand, cash on the line. Oh. How did the question, Mr. Spade? No cash, no tooth. You found another buyer? Yeah. A man named Constantino de Braganza says the tooth belongs on the head of his ancestor by a previous marriage. Oh, acquaintance he told me. And what else did he say to you? That he'd double any bid that you made on the tooth. My dear fellow, have you any inkling, any remote idea of the value of that tooth? No? Well, I'll tell you, sir. But let me warn you. If I tell you, and you do not then produce the tooth. Yeah, yeah. Let's get on with it, Governor. Yes. Let's sit down, sir. <clears throat> How much do you know the 16th century history of the Orient? Not enough to fill that tooth with. Uh, Capital joke, sir. I shall give you a little more. And that's say to fill an elephant tusk. I'm listening. <clears throat> yeah. uh, well, sir, when the Portuguese invaded India in the 16th century and established the city of Goa, there were three main empires in the Orient, namely China, India, and Burma. And the rulers of all three empires sought to rule the world. Now, legend had it that in order to become lord of the world, 
The monarch had first to be the possessor of seven gems. That's gems spelled with a J, sir. Yes, gems. This is no fantasy, I'm telling you, Mr. Spade. This is actual history. Seven gems. And what were those seven gems? You tell me. Uh, the first six do not concern us, Mr. Spade. A golden wheel, a white elephant, all easy to come by for an oriental monarch. But the seventh. Ah, Mr. Spade, the seventh. What was that, a tooth? The tooth, Mr. Spade, the tooth. The sacred tooth of the great Lord Buddha himself. That remained in the temple of Malegawa at Kande, on the island of Ceylon. So many kings sent armies to capture it, but all were defeated by the fierce Brahmins who stood guard at the temple gates. And so, uh, we come to the year 1552. It's about time. Now, in that year, the Portuguese viceroy, Dom Constantino de Braganza, landed near Jaffna with a force of 1,220 men and defeated the king's legions in a savage battle. Mm. He returned to Goa with his victorious army and the tooth, which he retained as his personal prize. It was not long before the Burmese king, Bainau, by name, sent an emissary to Dom Constantino, offering the modern equivalent of a million pounds sterling as ransom for the two. How to get the Portugal? Oh, hear me out, sir. Hear me out, hear me out. Well, all right. Well, before the transaction could be consummated, the Portuguese archbishop called on Dom Constantino and in the name of the Inquisition demanded the tooth. After some delay, Dom Constantino, under threat of torture, delivered a tooth into the archbishop's hand. And that tooth was publicly destroyed. The archbishop grinding it into powder with water and pestle and scattering the residue upon a fire that the tooth might be utterly consumed. Shortly after this, Dom Constantino's personal physician, after drawing a tooth, now mind you, a tooth, from the viceroy's head, died under very mysterious circumstances. And we may safely infer that the substitute tooth which he drove into the viceroy's jawbone after the primitive fashions of dentistry in those days was the candy tooth put there for safekeeping until Don Constantino could resume negotiations with my noun emissary. Uh, yeah, uh, but... But, 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 before that could be accomplished, Don Constantino was stricken with the plague, carried aboard ship, and home to Portugal, where he died. He was entombed with a candy tooth still in his head. Now, the manuscript which fell into the possession of the Russian Kemidov and later into mine, but I shall not go into unnecessary detail, of course not. was Don Constantino's deathbed confession, proving beyond the shadow of a doubt that the real Candy Tooth had reposed for more than four centuries, not in the great temple at Candy in Ceylon, but in a Portuguese tooth. Yeah, well, I think I can take it from there. Uh, <clears throat> you still haven't told me what my percentage is. Well, my dear boy, if your percentage were one-tenth of one percent of what can be realized on that tooth, you could retire to a life of sloth and luxury for the rest of your days. <laughs> for the restoration of the true relic, there is no limit to what the Buddhist world could and would pay. Gifts and tribute paid to one temple alone exceed $11 million a year. <laughs> now, my boy, you begin to comprehend something of its value? I'll still settle for cash. Uh, very well, then. $10,000. It's a deal. You understand, Mr. Spade. Now that you have my secret, the affair must be gotten over quickly, for good and all. If it is not, believe me, this time I shall not bargain with you for my life. You shall bargain with me for yours. <laughs> After I left Gutman, I called you, Dundee, and found out by a clever ruse where Herman Julius's body had been sent. You told me. Then I hustled on over to the mortuary. As I walked in, a hushed young man wearing a hushed cutaway and a hushed expression greeted me. Good evening, sir. I'm Converse Etheridge. Can I be of service? Thank you. I've uh, come to pay my last respects to an old friend. I, uh, can I be alone with him for a few minutes? His name? Uh, Julius. Herman Julius? Oh, yes, yes. His widow is here, sir. Mrs. Julius. His widow, huh? Yes, she's inconsolable. Uh, perhaps, as a dear friend of the departed, you might give her words of comfort. Please go in. Thank you. A little woman in black was sobbing quietly to herself. She turned around when she heard me come in. Her eyes lit up with hatred, and suddenly she grabbed something from her pocketbook and held it at me. It was a forty-five, and her hand was shaking. Yeah, this time I will do it. All right, before I didn't have the heart... All this hating bloodshed. But this time. Yeah, this time. Nick, Nick, Frau Julius. It, it point, point. You. You are not one of them. No, no, I'm a detective. I, I want to punish the people responsible for your husband's death. Yeah. yeah I believe you. This gun. I was going to follow poor Herman. There didn't seem to be any reason for going. Um, uh, tell me something about yourself and your husband, Mrs. Julius. Uh, it's an old story now. 
years of separation in different concentration camps. Bribery and bribery. Then my children and I, we were finally released. Came to this country. After two years, Herman brought us from Lisbon. We knew soon he would be with us. But even though the war was finished, they had lost. Still they were not a Herman Julius. He knew the Nazis were behind him all the time. And even here, in this country, he did not dare come to me. Mrs. Julius, uh, you see, uh, those people that followed your husband this time weren't Nazis. They, they weren't even after him. They were after something he was carrying. In uh, Lisbon, didn't he go to a dentist named Laverne? Oh, yeah. And didn't, yeah, that... didn't uh, Laverne put an odd-shaped tooth, kind of yellow, into his bridge work? Just, yeah. So he smuggled the candy tooth out of Portugal and he never even knew it. Oh, well, it does not matter now. Oh, Herman is dead. Surely you, they will leave his poor broken body in peace. I doubt it very much, Mrs. Julius. No. No, surely they will. That's why I want to make a request of you. You see, others have died besides your husband because of this thing. More will die unless you do as I ask you. Oh, to stop terror. Any terror. I will do anything, Mr. Spirit. Anything you say. I told her what I wanted done, and she agreed to do it. Then I started on my part of it. I called Gutman on the, at the St. Mark and told him 11 at my apartment. Then I called Dom Constantino at the San Rafael. Hope and I got there around 10.30. Go on in, Angel. Well, this is where you live, Sam? Where I sleep. Must be lonely for you. Sorry, no vacancy. Sam, listen. There's so much I want to tell you about myself. I'm listening. Well, listen. Just before the war started, I was engaged to marry a man named Kemidoff in London. The Russian, yeah. Government mentioned him. Something about an old manuscript? Yeah, Kemidoff had stolen it. In India, it was very old, and Kemidoff said that the information in it made it worth more than the Maltese Falcon. It was in Latin. Mm-hmm. How'd the fat man get this manuscript away from Kemidoff? So you, uh, double-crossed Kemidoff and took the manuscript to Gutman. Sam, before they get here, I've got to tell you something. No matter what happens, I want you to know this. Sure, I... sure, I know. Say it, Angel. Don't torture me, Sam. I'd like to hear it, Angel. I... Oh, Sam, I love you so much, it feels like hate. It feels like a... Go on, go on. Hate me, Angel. I... Darling. <sighs> No. No, don't answer it, Sam. Relax, Angel. You'll be okay. Sam? Yeah? Only you, Sam. All I want out of... Only you. Just stay on third, Angel. I'll bat you home safe. You see, sir, I have a punctual man. Come on in, Gutman. <laughs> Look, the same apartment, the same colors, everything the same. Yeah, the same rat race, Carol. Hello, Marvin. Uh, Killed anybody since lunch? You want me to give it to your shaman? Oh, please, please, Marvin. No unpleasant talk. Uh, Mr. Gutman, please tell Marvin. In here, gentlemen. Yes, 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 Marvin. Mrs. Spade, I'm sure, regrets the unfortunate... Well... And what have we here? You all know the lady? You see, Mr. Gutton, you see, I told you. Now he's dealing with her. Oh, this is... Shut up, you hear me? Shut up. Uh, Don't talk, that's right, Tom. I'm I'm jumpy. I don't feel good. I don't know why. You shut up, too. Always fighting violent on prisoners. I am getting too old for this. Uh, Now, Mr. Spade, to the business at hand. You have the truth. I want some answers first. Did you have our dentist friend Laverne killed? No. Did Marvin kill Laverne? No. Cairo? No. Nobody killed Laverne. He died of old age. Have you uh, asked the uh, little lady there? Sam. i got to ask you, baby. Oh, Sam, how could Answer you? Answer me. No, Sam, you know I didn't. Well, it doesn't matter. i got my pigeon pick to take the fall. Oh, I don't think so. Now, 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 Bobby, retain yourself. No violence. Well, sir, I... That's it. Sit still. Uh, I have a package from the Avalon Mortuary for Mr. Speed. Oh, hello, sir. Yeah, let's have it. Uh, Mrs. Julius said to tell you... Yeah, yeah, thanks. 
Well, Gatman, this is it. This little package. The candy tooth. The tooth at last. Give it me, sir. Give it me. Oh, Mr. Gatman, it's all over. We've got it. We've got it. We have. Come, sir. No more teasing. Uh, 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 uh. Put those fat lunch hooks down before I chop them off. <laughs> I rather thought this was no. What now, sir? I told you there was another bidder. And there he is. I would advise you not to reach for your gun, Mr. Spade. You're pointing that gun at the wrong belly. The fat man's inside. Mr. Gutman, Mr. Cairo, Dom Constantino de Braganza of Portugal. Portugal, indeed. It's the Russian. Kenedoff. Do not be so formal, Hope, my darling. You may call Mr. Gavanovich. All right, let's get off the Kopeck. We're all here. You see, you see, Mr. Mr. Gutman. Say, you are an unmitigated cancer. You knew all along this man was an imposter. That was the name he gave me. Eh, hey, what matter? There's enough for all. Such a so magic, Mr. Spade. You'll please give me that package. Now, Marvin, now! <laughs> They both had their guns into each other at once, practically. Kamadov fired first, but Marvin didn't fall. He spit out his chewing gum, and then he squeezed the trigger of his forty-five. They both looked more surprised than anything else. But they were both very dead before they fell down. Marvin! Marvin. Dead. As dead as Kamadov. Oh, and it was worth it. You know, of course, it was he who killed Laverne. I told you I had my pigeon picked for the fall. My God, man, you are a winner. <laughs> Poor Marvin, he looks so dead. You can have the package now. Right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. The tooth, the tooth, sir. He seized the package with his fat little fingers. They were trembling so he could hardly undo the strings. He tore the outer wrappings, exposed a small metal jar. He looked at me and wrenched the lid off. Uh, yes, sir. He dumped the contents onto the table. Oh, the tooth, what is it? There's nothing here. Ashes, ashes, sir, ashes. That's it, Gutman, Ashes. The tooth is there, along with the rest of Herman Julius. He was cremated this afternoon. Cremated? The tooth, it was cremated. No, this, it cannot be, no. But it is, it is the tooth. Oh, you idiot. Again, you are the idiot. Why do I stay with him? Why, why? Well, well. Why? Well, come, 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 sir. Shall we stand here weeping and bemoaning a curious quirk of fate? Or shall we defy all fates? Uh, were we not well underway to finding the Romanov scepter when this charming lady detoured us with her romantic notions? Come, come. What say you, Joel, eh? You, you mean we, we yes. go to... Yes, Joel, to Samar. Oh, Mr. Burton, do not say it. He is listening. Ah, uh, uh, yes. A wise precaution. Then we go, eh? Yes, Mr. Gutman. Yes, we go. Uh, adieu, Mr. Spade. <laughs> oh, sound. It's like the stage of the old Vic at the final curtain of Hamlet. Alas, poor Marvin... I knew him well. Oh, well, many a slip puts the cup and the tooth. <laughs> I let him go, Mr. Montgomery. I knew there was nothing on him that Dundee's boys could make stick. I thought twice before I let Dundee take Hope Laverne, but we both agreed it was a smart thing to do. And what do you suppose Effie said when I said... Period. And a report. Oh, say, for once you came out ahead. Twenty thousand dollars. Oh, just think of the things we can do. You pay all the bills, the years then on the office, have that awful old leather chair we upholstered, and, and a, a new ribbon for my typewriter. Effie, uh, about that typewriter ribbon. Well, maybe I can get along on this one for a while, but... Sam, I do think we should get my mother's earrings out of Moshe's pawn shop. Effie, I, I know this is going to be a terrible blow to you, but... Sam, what did you do with the twenty thousand dollars? I, uh, put it up for bail. Bail? Yeah. But that was the $20,000. And you're released so you get the money. It's very simple, Sam. You just go down and ask him for uh, it. Effie, you, you see, you don't understand these things. Now, bail is a very complex legal technicality. You see, you put up a bond and then you... Sam, how much was the bail for Hope Laverne? Yeah, that's what I mean, Angel. Oh, Sam, you're such a child. You'll never see her again. She was just... Just using me. I'll take it, Abby. Hello? Hello, kitten. Sam, I'm free. Shall I come over? Well, I'll always be waiting for you, kitten. Me too, Sam. Kitten, indeed. The A.T. Kitten. What's that, Angel? Oh, forget it, Sam. I just get... Can't figure me out, eh, Angel? Well, I'll tell you. I've lived without faith, and I've lived without charity, but I've just got to have... Out here is what I say. Oh, good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. (laughs) 
This is Robert Montgomery. I'm sure our suspense audience agrees with me when I say that whenever it is, it can't be too soon to have Sam Spade back with us again in a full-hour adventure on radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Incidentally, our producer, editor, director on these weekly full hours of suspense, Bill Spear, joins hands with Dashiell Hammett to bring you the adventures of Sam Spade each Sunday night on this network. Thanks for the plug, Bob. I have a basket full of thanks to my friend Howard Sam Duff, the kind of actor I director lights candles for, and the wonderful Lorraine Tuttle who plays Effie each week, and to Joseph Kearns, who is the Casper Gutman of them all, and to all you other ornaments to your profession, Kathy Lewis, Wally Mayer, Jay Novello, Jeanette Nolan, Jack Edwards Jr., Sidney Miller, Hans Conrad, and Bill Johnston. And, of course, as always, to our musical director and conductor, Led Gluskin, and to the composer of our original scores, Lucian Morrowick. And our special thanks to Bob Tolman and Jason James, who wrote The Candy Tooth, and who were voted by their fellow Mystery Writers of America, the Edgar Allan Poe Award for Sam Spade, the best detective show on the air. And to the Wild Root Company, a gracious sponsor of Sam, for this courtesy and cooperation in making tonight's spadery available. Now tell about next week, Bob. Next week, we will bring you another great American master of suspense. The author of The Postman Always Rings Twice and Double Indemnity, James M. Kane. It's a full hour of Mr. Kane's very wonderful no- novel, Love's Lovely Counterfeit. This is Robert Montgomery, who will welcome you once again next week to radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Don't forget, next week at the same time, a full hour of... Suspense! This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The new cream deodorant presents David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington, calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington, calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy, calling Washington. David Harding Counter Spy is brought to you by Fresh. Fresh, the new cream deodorant that stops perspiration worries safely. Switch to Fresh, to be sure. Two weeks ago, Charles Pierce, a man in his early 30s, immaculately dressed, slight, with piercing eyes, stood in the hallway of a large gray stone apartment building in Baltimore. With him was a young woman, Dora Lester. I do not feel this is good, Charles. It's the biggest opportunity we ever had, Dora. You have never met this man. Oh, I know all about him, though. He is in command. There's a very strange in my stomach. A woman's intuition. That's enough. We're paid well to take chances. You do not think this is a trick? You have your gun? Mm -hmm. Always. But I won't need it, Dora. It's a great honor to meet him. His espionage work is known all over the world. For two years, he was in command of all Gestapo agents in Spain. Yes? Mr. Berlin? Yes, we received your message to come here. When? Day before yesterday. We were in Boston. Come in. Come over to the table. Press it down, please. Now, she will establish your identity. Now, this is my lady friend, Dora Lester. She worked with me under Hans. Just a moment. Remove your hat, Dora. Why, yes, yes. Oh, this picture is a very good likeness of you. You, You've got a picture of me? When was it taken? The important part is that it was taken for identification. So you use the name Charles P. 
tears. Are you with some identification, Mr. Burley? Unnecessary. I was standing unobserved right at the desk of the hotel when you signed in last night. I wanted to see your handwriting. Well, no wonder Mr. Burley is famous for your precautions. From now on, you two will take orders from me. Come along. May I ask where we are going? To the eighth floor balcony of a certain building. You'll be very surprised at what you see. A person could very easily fall to his death from this balcony. Couldn't he, Mr. Burley? Very easily, Dora. Not how. See that long, low building over there? The one fenced in with the barbed wire? Yeah. That building is the United States Government Laboratory. It covers these two acres. And the guards who are patrolling there? Just a moment. Can I close the fire door? There are 12 guards there. Night and day. There's a beam of an electric eye which goes all around the building. Automatic protective devices of every description. So they protect and gold something even more valuable. Bugs. Bugs? You fool. No. There are bugs in there worth as much as $5,000 each. I hate bugs. I couldn't hate any bug worth $5,000. What is the mystery of them, Mr. Burley? One of the greatest allies of the Japanese, disease caused by jungle bugs. Disease Americans have never experienced. Well, the United States government has had hundreds of specialists capturing these odd bugs in the Pacific. Oh. These bugs are brought to this country and placed in that building. Each species, especially heated rooms, tropical conditions, their own special food. And they're bred there. Millions of them. You mean they keep all of the bugs there so the United States can experiment on them to develop poison sprays to kill each different kind? Exactly. New poisonous sprays could not be developed to kill these bugs if there were not thousands of those different species to experiment on. The breeding of some of these bugs is a very complicated process. For instance, Mr. Burley. United States Marines land on an island. Yes, and possibly in 24 hours, a certain percentage of the Marine invaders will be suffering from sickness caused by some kind of a bite from these little known bugs. Each island, each jungle is hundreds of different kinds. But suppose the Marines do know about the bugs before they land. What can they do about it? If a certain poisonous spray has been developed, effective against the type of bugs they know they will encounter. American planes fly over the island with thousands of gallons of the spray. Spray the jungles, many of the bugs will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. No wonder those bugs in that laboratory are valuable. But the way that laboratory is guarded, it would be impossible to get near it or destroy the bugs. Impossible for anyone but me. See that building just at the end of the laboratory? Yeah. That is a scientific library. And it is open to medical students who wish to do research there on insecticides. Is it guarded? Certainly. The guard at the door. He searches everyone when they enter or leave. The guard's name is Connors. Connors. In the evening when he's off duty, Connors often drinks beer down the street over at the platform of the stand. Yeah. You have to meet him. Find out what his hobbies are. What he eats. What he likes. Then we'll talk to me that telephone. Hello? Mr. Burley? Yes? That gentleman you asked me to meet. Yes? I've become quite friendly with him. His hobby is, uh, dogs. Dogs? Yes. He talks about them by the hour. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, 
What shall I do? Come to my apartment at 11 tonight. And we'll visit the scientific library again tomorrow. I want to have something planned. Hi, Charlie. Well, well be, of all the times you've come to the library here, you didn't tell me you owned a dog. How do you like him? Come here, boy. Come here. <laughs> hey, that's a peach of a dog. Dozy Shepherd. Yeah. Boy, that's your mouth. <laughs> you like a dog so much, Charlie, you sold me the idea. Why well, bought this one? About two years old, huh? Uh-huh. Now you got something. Yeah, and he's highly trained. I don't want to lose out on my reading at the library here, so uh, can I take him in with me and tie him to the leg of the chair? Well, I don't know if I should let you, but... <laughs> yeah, that dog's almost human, ain't he? How about it? Okay, take him in with you. Hey, Tully! Wait a minute. Yeah? I got a set you, you know. It still has to after knowing me so well? This library section's right next to the scientific laboratory, you know. I wouldn't let my own mother in without searching it. Okay. Arms up. Yep. Turn around. Okay. You're still a fellow guard, Johnny. I got two kids in the Pacific. You bet I'm thorough. <laughs> Okay, Charlie, you keep him quiet so you can take him in. You know, Dora, this dog doesn't like Mr. Burley's apartment here. I can see it from the way he looks, Charlie. Not Charles, yes, sir. For three weeks now, you've been taking this dog into the library next to the laboratory. You sure the guard likes the dog? Connie? Crazy about him. That amount of potassium I gave for the dog. Really yeah, made him look good and sick. Oh, yeah, yeah. His nose was hot and dry. His, uh, his eyes glassy. Mm -hmm. And you did not bring the dog's apparent sickness to the attention of Connie. Oh, no, no, no. I was just going into the scientific library with a dog when he looked at him and he said, uh, your dog's sick, Charlie. Give him sulfur fires or... And if I was you, I'd put a blanket on him for a couple of days. Keep him bundled up. Perfect. So the guard himself suggested the blanket. <laughs> sure did. Wonderful. Yeah, easy, boy, easy. Come here. It's our big moment, Charlie. The climax. Now, the penalized. Penalized? What's that? It's an explosive more powerful than TNT. Explosive? That's right. And a little time watch. That'll set it off. You. You will throw the explosive and the time watch right into the underside of the dog's blanket. Well, I... You walk into the library with a sick dog that the guard Connors has got a weakness for. You will search you. And with his type of mind, you'll never think to feel under the dog's heavy blanket. Because he himself suggested the blanket. Yeah, yeah. But what about me? We'll tie the dog to a leg of a chair in the library. The time watch will set the charge off at exactly 11. At five minutes of 11, make an excuse. Walk out. Disappear. I've a dream to such a thing. I'll blow the library and the laboratory with all its experience. Expensive bugs off the face of the earth. It'll take them years to collect them, breed new ones. It seems like the dog knows what's going on. Tomorrow morning, Charles. Take the dog in the taxi cab. Drive right to the laboratory. We'll have enough explosive wrapped around him to blow a city to kingdom come. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to that part of our program known as Be Fresh or Be
be fired. <laughs> yes, the be fresh or be fired department. Maybe you might want to call it the be fresh or be lonely department. But anyhow, it's a quiz corner where a fresh answer is always welcome. First question. Why do you refer to four o'clock in the working day as the time when you're apt to come up against the deodorant deadline? And the answer? Because when you're working, an embarrassing deodorant failure is more likely to happen toward the day's end. When you're out on the date at night, ten o'clock is another sort of zero hour. But why be worried? Switch to that new cream deodorant fresh, to be sure. Second, a man's question. Is using fresh a sissy thing to do? And the answer? Well, fresh is a big seller among GIs and post exchanges all around the world. That's the answer. Which brings us to a question frequently asked. I get conflicting advice from people I know on how to be sure of personal daintiness. I'm confused. Well, friends, as many famous beauty editors and authorities on good grooming can tell you, modern science has the answer. And fresh brings it to you. In fresh, you get the benefit of the most effective perspiration-stopping ingredient known to science. Fresh contains an exclusive ingredient. Fresh cream deodorant stops perspiration worries completely and safely. It's safe for you and for your clothing. It's creamy and smooth, not sticky, doesn't dry out, and it's never gritty. So it's a pleasure to switch to fresh, to be sure. Back to David Harding, Counter Spy. Oh, oh. Driver, pull up right in front of the scientific library. Right next to the uh, the laboratories, then? Okay, buddy. What's the matter with your dog? Got the tip? (laughs) Not feeling good. I was wondering why you had a blanket on him in this hot weather. Fifty-five, mister. Let me get my dog out first. Come on, boy. Get out. Get out. <laughs> he seems to like staying in my cab, huh? Get out. Come on, come on, come on. Hey, I guess he sees the big dog the woman's got over there. Got to change for dollar? Oh, sure. I guess the big police dog over there don't like your dog. Stop it, stop it. Hey, there. That woman's having trouble holding her dog. Hey, hold on to your dog. Don't bring him over here. He's stronger than I am. There's going to be some action. Hey, hold on to that dog. Boy, come here, come here. You're too late, mister. Well, you've got to hold that dog. Get your dog away. Come on, boy. Come here. He's lost him. laboratory saw it happen. And the explosion resulted from a dog fight. A dog fight? The most fantastic thing. We're up against a very unusual mind, Everett. Anything left from the explosion to examine? Nothing. The man who had one of the dogs, the woman who had the other dog, the taxi cab, the taxi cab driver, all were blown to bits. It was a terrific explosion. As soon as we reach Baltimore, we'll set up a thorough investigation. (laughs) 
Baltimore Field Office, Hardig, for you. We located the kennels, Mr. Harding, where the dog was bought. The man came in and bought the dog without leaving his name or address. What do our agents report from the scene of the explosion? Another thing. It must have been a terrific explosion. What about the man who drove the taxi? Uh, he's a discharged veteran. Good American. Oh. Uh-huh. Well, Everett, this is one of the most uniquely conceived plots. There just isn't any starting point. Let me think a minute. We've got to find the starting point. These agents will make another attempt to destroy that laboratory. What are your orders, sir? Enemy agents had a dog. They now don't have a dog. We could start a house-to-house canvas. Well, it'll take us months. Come back to the field office, Everett. I've got an idea. We'll work out of here. I'm feeling very nervous, Mr. Vanilli. Can't we leave this apartment and go someplace? What time is it, Dora? Almost midnight. All right. We'll go out to eat. Seems funny not having Charlie around. Don't mention that fool. He bungled my whole plan. Has the newspaper said anything about the explosion? Just one little item. The government must have climbed down and censored it. You are going to try some other way to destroy the laboratory? Of course. But this time I'll do it myself. Hmm. You're, um, you're rather pretty, Dora. <laughs> I like you, too. <laughs> who's, who's that? You don't suppose Charlie really wasn't curious? Oh, curious this time of night. I'm frightened. Stop it. I didn't leave one possible clue. Yes? Are you Mr. Burley who lives here? Yes. I'm David Harding of the United States Counter Spies. This is one of my agents, Mr. Everett. May we come in, Mr. Burley? Why, yes, yes, come in. Miss Dora Lester, a friend of mine. How do you do, Miss Lester? This is Mr. Everett. How do you do? Miss Lester? May I ask why you're called, Mr. Harding? Well, three days ago, Mr. Burley, there was a dog which caused an explosion in front of the Baltimore Scientific Laboratories. Why, that's strange. Yes. Very strange, Mr. Burley. In fact, peculiar. These are government orders. Neither one of you is to move. Uh, come yes, in. A whole minute at all. I'm pressing you. No gun. Ever take this lesson? No gun either. Mr. Mr. Harding, your attitude is uncalled for. Mr. Burley, my men have been covering Baltimore. Restaurants, meat markets, pet shops, formulas, everything. Well, we found a restaurant right across the street where a man had been buying food for a dog every day. He hasn't bought any such food for the last three days. I suppose you're referring to me. Yes. Well, uh, what am I supposed to say? You're supposed to do some pretty tall explaining. Where is your dog, Mr. Burley? He, uh, died. Oh? He didn't die by being blown to bits, did he, Mr. Burley? No. My dog died a natural death. Oh, I see well, when a dog does die a natural death, of course, there's always the body. Isn't it? Why, uh, yes. Yeah. Where is your dog's body, Mr. Burley? Well, I was very attached to him. I took a little buried him in the country. Suppose you show us where. At this time of night? Yes. All right. Must I drive out, too? I'm afraid, Miss Lester, you must. David Harding will be back in a moment. But meanwhile, what do you think is the best advice to give to a young lady who says, You know, when my lipstick has gone back on me, or when it's worn off, or, <laughs> or maybe kissed off, my little mirror is a good friend. It always warns me. But when my deodorant has gone back on me, nothing or no one will warn me. What's a girl to do? Well, friends, as many famous beauty editors and experts on good grooming and personal charm can tell you, 
Modern science has the answer, and Fresh brings it to you. Yes, Fresh contains the most effective perspiration-stopping ingredient known. Fresh contains an exclusive ingredient. Fresh stops perspiration worries completely and safely. Ladies and gentlemen, each and every one of you, someday, sometime, may reach your deodorant deadline. The deodorant you are using may suddenly stop working. Why take chances? For lasting protection, switch to Fresh to be sure that... Yes. R-E-S-H. Fresh. Now, back to David Harding, Countess Spy. to help you raise a little the digging, Mr. Harding. They're doing all right, thank you, Mr. Burley. I'll just switch the beam of the searchlight, Everett. I feel like I'm going to faint. Keep so dark. You evidently don't believe me about burying my dog here, Mr. Harding. I'm afraid I don't, Mr. Burley. Look, Mr. Harding. There is something down there. What? Huh. Everett, dig a little more right there. Can you beat that? What do you think, Chief? Let me focus the flashlight. Your whole story of burying your dog here was preposterous. Well, I've had a dog for quite a while. Three days ago, he got taken with cramp. He died before I could get a doctor. I felt so badly, I brought him here and buried him in the seal. Miss Lester, we owe you an apology also. I'm so nervous and upset, frightened me so the way you came into the apartment. We do make mistakes sometimes, and this is one. Well, we'll just have to start from the beginning again. Look for another clue. I'll arrange immediately, Mr. Burley, for one of my agents to drive you and Miss Lester back to your apartment. <sighs> Seems so good to be back in the apartment again. The poor driver running out of gas. All over being upset from your experience tonight, Dora? Yes, Mr. Burley, I guess so. Everyone makes mistakes, you know. Me and Mr. Harding. He'd be a very charming man. I don't see how you ever found in that darkness where you buried that dog. Oh, that was simple. That was a dirty trick you pulled on me, Burley. I'm not in the habit of telling everyone everything. If you could have told me that you killed another dog and buried him out there. How do you think I felt all that time when you were claiming you did? And I was thinking as soon as you got out there, there wouldn't be any dogs there and we'd be caught. You might as well learn to trust my judgment. I'll go into your room and get cleaned up. We'll go out to a restaurant and get something to eat. Charles used to tell me everything he was doing. And Charles spoiled my whole plan and got himself blown to pieces. Just the same, we had fun together. And we... yeah! Get your hands up. Hold on. What's the meaning of this? Put your hands up. These cuffs are going on you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I can explain. You've already done your explaining, Burley. I hoped you wouldn't suspect anything when my agent pretended to run out of gas while bringing you two back to the apartment. It gave me time to go to the police station and see if anyone during the past three days had lost a black shepherd dog with a tooth missing from the lower right jaw. What does that prove? It proves that when your other dog was blown to pieces, you didn't dare go to the kennels and buy another. So you looked until you could steal one. You killed him and buried him out there just in case there was some slip and you were approached. Shall I be put in prison if I tell everything I know? Shut up, you fool. What I'd like to do to you, Burley, is throw you to a whole kennel of dogs. They give you what you deserve. But instead, you're going to go to the electric chair. And a lot of men will be coming home from the Pacific who wouldn't be if your fiendish plan had worked. 
Burley, consider yourself under arrest by the United States government for espionage and murder. And now here is Mr. Harding to tell you about next week's case. I have before me a report of a German minesweeper which has just sailed into an Atlantic port and given itself up. I have here a report of a suspect living at an expensive, exclusive summer hotel overlooking that same port. This girl has recently fallen in love. And here's a report of a body just found in the same harbor. All these things don't happen like that unless they're carefully planned. This case is an emergency. We're leaving to investigate it immediately. Here's a startling, exciting account of this case. Wednesday, August 1st, same time, same station. David Harding, Counter Spy. <laughs> David Harding, Counter Spy, is brought to you by a fresh. Fresh, the new cream deodorant that stops perspiration worry safely. Switch to fresh, to be sure. <laughs> David Harding Counter Spy is a Philip H. Lloyd production for Fresh, the new cream deodorant. This is the American Broadcasting Company. For Fresh, the new cream deodorant. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Fine does not pay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll take lost the Diablo every time. Nothing like it. Boy, that red sauce. <laughs> sure it ain't the spaghetti, Bill, on account of it looks like rope. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Hey, what, could why be. you use a rope all the time, Phil? A gun or even an ice pick would be quicker, like today. Puggy almost got away. Yeah, maybe Dookie's got something, Phil. Look how that joint fit my hand. That's because you're slipping, Tiny. You didn't used to have to stick your hand in their mouths. Well, I still don't answer Dookie's question. Yeah, Phil. Why a rope all the time? It's simple, like ABC. We all got records, ain't we? And you carry a loaded piece when you got a record, it's another felony, ain't it? Carrying concealed weapons, see? Well, I've been wise to the flat feet since I've been a kid. And nobody can prove in no court that you had a weapon on you when all you're carrying is a piece of rope. <laughs> In the interest of good citizenship and law enforcement, we present Crime Does Not Pay, based on the famous metro goldwyn Mayer series of short subjects. In just a moment, you will hear A Piece of Rope, starring Cameron Mitchell as Dukey DeFore. Does Not Pay, starring Cameron Mitchell as Juki DeFore in A Piece of Rope. There is a school of thought among the men whose job it is to fight organized crime that the old method of searching for clues and obtaining convictions on such evidence is not nearly as effective as attacking from within the organization itself by the use of informers. A typical case is that which involved Juki DeFore and the gang which made its headquarters in a certain city at the corner of Warrenburg and Paoli Avenues. This organization serviced other groups. They accepted commissions to do certain jobs, as they did on the day Jack Paris told them... Like I said, this Puggy Jackson is getting too smart for his own good. Like, for instance, what? You ask too many questions sometimes, Spitzberg. Why don't you behave nice and quiet, like Dookie here? Oh, Dookie, the kid's got a lot to learn yet. He'll learn working with you. 
Only don't teach him to ask too many questions. Sorry, Jack. I was only asking on account of if we know what he's pulling, we can find him easier. You'll find him? That's what I'm paying you for. Sure, we'll get him okay. They call him Poggy on account of his nose. Some two-bit punk flattened it for him. Now I want him flattened. Complete. Yeah, we'll take care of him. Sure, we'll take care of him. And no body, see? The bulls know he's been trying to cut me out. I don't want nothing to point to me. When we get through, there won't even be a grease spot. And it's a deal? Yeah, sure is. Sure is, Mr. Paris. Sure is. Okay, you got the contract. Just be sure you carry it out. Understand? Hey, Phil. Phil. Yeah, Dookie. Telephone, back in the store. Okay, I'm coming. Who is it? Wouldn't say. He just asked for Pittsburgh Phil. Know the voice? Sounds a little like Mr. Paris. Uh... We've got ants in his pants again. Yeah, sounds like it. Well, if we can't find the Jake, we can't take care of him. <laughs> you know Parrot. He thinks he's a big executive. Yeah, I know. Pittsburgh Phil here. What's wrong with you guys? Do I have to take my business someplace else? Well, take it easy. We'll get him. I've been waiting three weeks. He hijacked me again last night. We can't do nothing until we find him. Then find him. I'll give you three days. What's he want? Blood out of a stone. Yeah, I thought he was sore. I don't get him nothing. He give us three days. We gotta find that puggy. We'll find him. Tiny's making a contact today. All right, Tiny, that fat overstuffed. When you one. get as smart as Tiny or as strong, you can talk. Okay, okay, Phil. I didn't mean nothing. Don't bother me now. Okay. I gotta think. Go okay. catch a car or something. We'll need one for this job anyhow. I beg your pardon. Yeah, sure. So what? I, I wonder if you could give me some information. You hear that, Dookie? He comes to the corner of Warren Break and pay only for information. <laughs> yeah. That is, I was told I could find Tiny Schultz around here. Uh, why do you want Tiny? I uh, owe him some money. So Tiny's still Shylocking. What do you know? Well, I'm sure I don't know where Tiny is, but uh, if you let me have what you owe him, I'll see that he gets it. Oh, I'm very sorry. i got to see him personal. And uh, who shall I say came calling? Tell him uh, Puggy Jackson. Puggy Jackson. Um, now that I come to think of it, uh, I think I know where he might be. That's good. Yeah, it's good. Uh, tell you what, uh, Dookie. Yeah, right here. Take this gentleman around to Tiny's usual resorts, and uh, if you don't find them, bring the gentleman to my place in three quarters of an hour. I'm expecting Tiny there then. <laughs> gotcha. I don't like to put you to so much trouble. Like... Oh, any pal of Tiny's is a pal of mine. It's no trouble at all. In fact, pal, it will be a pleasure to know you better. You know, Josie, the rest of us girls... Well, I think you ought to know how lucky we think you are. Lucky? Me? Uh-huh, your own house, a fur coat, and... <laughs> oh, Phil's about the sharpest husband we ever saw. <laughs> I don't know, Ellen. He's like most husbands, I guess. Always dropping things that you got to pick up after him. But I will admit, Phil's anything but stingy. Uh, what business is Phil in, darling? Contracting. Dear. You mean like road building? Oh, goodness, no. no. I'm sure that's one business Phil never wants to get mixed up with. Well, what then, darling? To be perfectly frank, Josie, the girls were wondering and I said I'd ask you. Seeing as how I know you best, that is. Well, I don't know if I can describe it exactly, but... He takes orders and does things for people, kind of a service company. Uh-huh. Uh, but what kind of a company? Look, why don't you ask him yourself, Holly? That's his key in the door. Oh, Hiya, uh, girls. Uh, Hiya, darling. You know, Tiny, Josie, mm-hmm. Ellen, this is Tiny, Tiny Schultz. Hiya, Josie. Hello, Ellen. Of all people to call Tiny, for goodness sake. <laughs> sure. Anybody over 250, they call Tiny. The skinny guys, they call fat so. <laughs> Yeah, you really over 250, Tiny. 300 if it's a pop. <laughs> Nothing small about this character. Uh, look, Josie, some of the boys are coming over in a few minutes. Okay, Mr. Man. What is it tonight? Poker or talk? Talk, uh, mostly. Well, don't make a mess. How can talk make a mess? Oh, you don't know Phil's gang in their gab fest. Get your hat, dear. I didn't wear any. We'll go to a movie, Phil. Yes, good idea. Here's a fin. Treat the girls. Oh, thanks, dear. Hmm. Come on, Ellen. Well, I... Goodbye, all. Uh, so long. Hey, remember what I said, dear. No mess now. <laughs> what a thing. Well, let's get going, Tiny. 
Dookie will be here with the jug in ten minutes. Usual? Yeah, straight chair next to the door, big chair facing it. Yeah. That way. When the door opens, he'll see only you, and I can get him from behind. Yeah. How's this? Okay, uh, sit down and read that newspaper. How am I doing? Swell. What are you using? Here it is, Tiny, the usual. Four feet of brand new wash line. Now, all we got to do is wait. This the place? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is it, Mr. Jackson. Not bad. Very nice, in fact. It's kind of quiet. Oh, they'll be there. Phil said so. You sort of like this fella, don't you? Uh, he's the best. The best. Uh, let me ring the bell for you. Come on in, George Houghton. We're coming. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Jackson. After you. Oh, thanks, kid. Tiny. Come in, buddy. Been waiting for you. Come good. All right. Give me a hand. Get on him, Tiny. I'm trying. Stronger than I thought this chicken. Don't make me, Phil. Don't make me. Scared. Don't. Get him on the couch. Yeah. All right. Twist it. Twist the rope. I'm trying. Stop his mouth. Stop it. He's making too much noise. Yeah. He's got a mouthful of fist. Twist it, Phil. Sit on him. Hold him down. Yeah. Yeah, that does it. Well, that his character was strong. Hey, he's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Look what the dog did to my hand. That fella could get my jaw from a bite like that. You got any mercuric chrome, Phil? Iodine's better. No, no, I sneeze too much. Well, go look in the medicine chest. Josie's got all kinds of junk in there. I hate iodine. Oh, hope she's got my mercuric chrome. Ain't got my wind back yet. Maybe I'm slipping. Nah, you ain't slipping, Phil. You're done fine. Duke, get some of that newspaper quick. You gonna read the paper? Give me it, will you? Hey, you got mercuric chrome. What are you doing, laying them out in state? You heard Josie when she left. No mess on the rug, she said. It's all I need now, trouble with my wife. You, you ain't going to leave him here like this, are you, Phil? You got the car? No, I didn't have no time. I was taking him around the back. You can use mine. Mine for the night, anyway. Okay, roll him up. The rest of the rope is under the couch. Yeah. All right, here's the keys. You can go out and start the engine. Thanks. I'll have the car ready by the time you come out. Okay, usual way, Tiny. He's up, head down. Put him in a ball. He'll burn better that way. There, how's that, Phil? Good. Stay at the wheel. Come on, Tiny. Got the gasoline? Yeah, right here. Boy, it's quiet out here. And Dookie and me, we was riding around, we spotted these empty lots. Got them? By the rope, like a satchel. <laughs> Funny how a guy who weighs so little could be so smart. Yeah, this good enough. Now the gas. <laughs> okay, got a match? Uh, yeah, yeah. Here it goes. Come on, let's get out of here. All set, Phil? Yeah, get going. Hey. <laughs> hey, don't he make a pretty bonfire? In just a moment, Crime Does Not Pay will continue with A Piece of Rope. Now, we continue with Crime Does Not Pay, starring Cameron Mitchell as Juki DeFore in A Piece of Rope. The vacant lot where 
where Pittsburgh Phil and Tiny left the flaming body of Puggy Jackson was covered with weeds and sumac and littered with tin cans. Half a block away was a row of small houses. From one of those houses came a boy of 16 or so to watch the crackling bonfire. From the back door of another house came Emma Adams, in her hand a pan of water for her dog. Emma saw the flames and the boy standing there. Angrily, pan of water and all, she descended on the boy. Dare you start a bonfire here? I ought to call the police. Oh, honest, Miss Adams, I didn't start it. Honest. Just like all boys your age, do things before you think. With those weeds, catch, they'll set fire to the sumac bushes. Everything's dry as a bone. The whole neighborhood could burn down for all you care. But I didn't do it. I was just watching. Oh, that's I... what you all say. I'm going to put it out. Okay, put it out. See if I care. All right. There. Hey. Hey, there's something in that fire. It ain't wood. <laughs> Miss Adams, Adams, hey, cut it out, Miss Adams. Somebody will think I hit you. Hey, stop. What's going on here? What are you up to, young fellow? Oh, it's not me. It's not me. There, in the fire. Officer, a dead man is in the fire. In the fire. Oh, for heaven's sake. Stop that yelling now, lady. You're safe, I tell you. Young fellow, get to a phone quick now. Call the precinct. Tell them Officer Martin told you. Give him the address. Run now, run. You ought to be a radio cop. Oh, Miss Adams, you're safe. 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 Miss
All right, we're going to close it up. Then give me a hand with the girl. Why do they always faint? Does it do any good? So what have we got, Wiener? What have we got? We got a body. Period. We haven't got that anymore, literally speaking. It was released for burial yesterday. Then we got a funeral to go to. Watch. What for? I know who will be there. And you know more than I do. The mother, the sister, a few relations, Pittsburgh Phil Stone, Tiny Schultz, Dukey DeFour. How do you figure that? Their handwriting is all over the job. The method. The attempt to dispose of the body. The rope, especially. Those boys know you can't prove a rope is in violation of the concealed weapons law. They never carry guns. Uh, smart. Very. But... If we start from the idea that they did it... But why? Puggy never worked in that district. They were hired, as usual. Go on. They have a weak sister in their outfit. Huh. Weak or not, I'd hate to turn my back on any one of them in an alley. Except Stooky. The kid? Right. I've got an idea, Wiener. Dukey doesn't know us. He's never seen either of us. Come along, Wiener. We're going for a little ride. Out to the corner of Warrenburg and Paoli Street. Okay, Wiener, pull over and park. Leave the engine running. Check, Lieutenant. Watch yourself, Lieutenant. Don't worry, I'm a big boy now. I'll move, Dookie. What? Be letting your back, Dookie. You're through, kid. You're through. Look, I didn't do nothing. Honest, I didn't. Don't look behind you. You do, and you'll never see anything again. Oh, no, please, Shut honest. up. Do like I tell you. See that black car across the street? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Start walking nice and easy, just as if you were going for a ride. <laughs> How are we doing? On schedule, sir. Don't rush. We don't want no trouble with cops. What? No trouble. You heard me, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Look. What? Why don't you say something? I never, I never seen you before. Puggy Jackson never saw you either. Who's Puggy Jackson? Look, look, where are we going? Where are you guys taking me? What do you care? You're not coming back. Look, I didn't do nothing. All I did was take orders. You can't blame me if something went wrong. We got a job to do, that's so. all. You understand that, Dookie. Yeah, sure. Sure. Look, look I, I got some dough. I got it stashed. You, you can have it if you let me go. All of it. Nobody will ever know. I'll disappear. Change my name. You can, you can, you can tell your boss you took care of me. I never did nothing like that. Nothing. Just, I was the driver is all, but I never touched anybody, not even Puggy. You hear that, Joe? He says he never touched Puggy. He says. But I didn't. So, so you are some of Puggy's boys, but I never touched him. I just drive the car after, just after I drove the car. Look, look, I'll give you the door. Like I said, if you let me live, see? Look, I want to live, you see? And I'll do more. I'll think of the others for you. I'll show you. Pittsburgh Fifth and Tiny Phil. They did it. I watched them. They did it. They did it, I tell you. I never laid a hand on them. Honest. Honest. You gotta believe me. You say something, will you? Don't just sit there like a statue or something with a gun in your pocket. Say something. I'll play ball. I'll play ball. I'll think of play. I know. You I know a lot. You know what anybody thinks. Say something. Please, you gotta let me go. You gotta let me go. You gotta. You gotta. Should I tell him, Joe? Yeah, I'd tell him. Put him out of his position. Okay, might as well. No, 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 don't shoot. Let it go. Don't take it out, please. No gun, Dookie. Just my hand in my pocket. Cops never carry guns in their pockets. They might catch it in the lining. You. You. Cops. Yes. Want to see our badges, Dookie? Cops. I spill my guts to cops. You want to live, don't you, Dookie? What do you mean? You want to fry, Dookie? Fry? 
try. No, 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 I'll talk. Oh, I'll talk plenty. I want to live. Tell me I can live if I sing. Please, please tell me. Down the radio, Wiener. Tell him to pick up Pittsburgh, Phil and Tiny Schultz, and turn back. We'll take this punk in with us. Jack, Lieutenant. Here we go, Dogey. After you sing, home to Mama. No, you can't do that. I'll talk. Oh, I'll talk, but you got to give me protection. I can't go home. I wouldn't live a day, not if I talk. One way or the other, I'm done. you got to protect me. I'll tell. Everything I know, I'll tell you. But you got to help me. you got to give me protection. I want to live. you got to help me. If I help you, you got to help me. you got to Cameron Mitchell, who was starred as Juki DeFore in A Piece of Rope, will be back with you in just a moment. Now, here in person is Cameron Mitchell. Well, I think it's obvious to everyone that Dukey DeFore became a criminal not so much of his own free will as because of the conditions into which he was born and the friends he made who came into existence in the same poverty-stricken slum areas where Dukey himself first saw the light of day. It follows, then, at least to my way of thinking, that a certain responsibility rests upon all of us more fortunate citizens. Our own complacence... Even the shameful little thrills we get when we read of murders and other sadistic crimes in our daily papers tend to encourage, rather than uproot, the organized crime which has such a tight grip on so many phases of our national life. And in the last analysis, it falls on us, even more than on our police, to prove to one and all that crime does not pay. Thank you, Cameron Mitchell. Time Does Not Pay is written by Ira Marion and directed by Mark D. Lowe, with music composed and conducted by John Gart. Technical advisor is Brenton B. Turpus. The events, characters, and names used in the story you've just heard are fictitious. Any similarity is purely coincidental. <laughs> Now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case history. Gangbusters! Tonight, Gangbusters presents the case of the collector who robbed Midwestern supermarkets of thousands of dollars until a case of cigarettes Put him out of business. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable Leonard L. Murphy, Chief of Detectives of the St. Louis, Missouri Police Department, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. Chief Murphy, you've told me that it's surprising how many criminals actually have very clever ideas. Yes, Don Gardner, but in these instances, being clever doesn't mean being smart. If they were smart, they never would have used their talents in the direction they did. Invariably, these clever boys know they have a quick mind, but they overestimate their shrewdness in a quest for lots of money with no work. Well, your case for tonight took place in the city of St. Louis, Chief Murphy? Yes, that's right, Don. And one night not long ago, a young man and a girl were seated in the last row of a mammoth movie theater on Grand Avenue. The last showing of the picture just ended, and the audience was filing out to the strains of the giant Wurlitzer organ. Oh, what a picture. If you want to see it over again, you got to come back tomorrow. Okay, a girl can dream, can't she? Sure, it's someplace else. Come on. Oh, honest, Rich. You've got about as much romance as a turtle. It was a wonderful picture. Pardon us, please. Pardon, please. The way he came back to her at the end and then just held her. Oh, gosh, for the picture. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. Rich. What? Where are we going? Home. Where do you think? I'm hungry. I'll buy you a candy bar. Well, uh, stick here a minute. I'll be right back. Where are you going? Uh, just stick here. I'll be back. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, Richard. Rich. 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 R
ditch. How long could I hide behind a flower pot? I got interest in the picture. Come on, let's get this over with. Make it quick and to the point. Don't worry, I like them that way. So you don't get your hair mussed up. That's one reason. Well, they believe in advertising. There it is. Treasurer's office. Okay, I'm set. Knock. Right. Come in. The guy out front said to see you. We've got a little... Get him up. up. Hey. Come, we'll be going to crack on the head. Or worse, maybe. Sit still, bud. Oh, here it is. All wrapped up pretty for the bank. Grab it and let's go. What about Junior here? He must get awful sleepy working nights. Yeah, but sleep. Good. Oh, I got a date waiting, you know. You don't have to drag me. Okay, all clear. Get moving. Rich! Hey, Rich! What? Come here a minute, will you? What do you want now, stud? Is my tie straight, Rich? Oh, you and your ties. I'll straighten your tie for you. Okay, so I'll use the mirror. Hey, that was a nice piece of business last night, Rich. Well, I'm glad you're happy. Now, I'm counting on plenty of jobs like that, Rich. Stud's got to be kept in more of these fancy ties. Well, you'll have enough to hire a valve. Uh-oh. You were expecting anyone? In the morning? Grab a gun and get behind the door. Okay. Okay, just a minute. Yeah, who is it? Francie. Open up, will you? Francie. Oh, all right. Now, look, Francie. Look you... yourself. Hello, Francie. You're up early. Do you want to make something of a drape shape? What's eating you? What's eating me? I'll tell you what's eating me. I open up the paper this morning, and what do you think is staring me in the face? What? That movie house was held up last night, as if you didn't know. All right, so what? Oh, wait here a minute, Francie. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Took me there under false pretenses. That's what you did. Would you felt any better if you knew we were going to do the job? That's beside the point. I got better things to do than play decoys for a couple of hundred. Name one thing better. Listen, Wolf in Wolf's clothing. I didn't come here okay, to talk okay. to you. Okay, okay. Get it down to a convulsion, will you? These walls talk back. You can heist all the joints you want. And you can spend all the dough on me. But if I'm part of any job, knownst or unbeknownst, I want what I got coming. I'll give you what you got coming. Dad. Come on. By yourself. Let me see if I get you straight, Francie. Uh, you want to go to work? Look, Pappy, I got to pay my rent the same as anybody else. Not with my money, you don't. If you don't like it, Bo Crummel, pick up your pork pie and take a walk. I'm in. Well, not yet, Francie. I have to work out an angle. Oh, that's easy. There's always an angle. But you just angled me right out of the picture. Take it easy, stud. I got an idea this is going to be good for all of us. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Lewis. Hey, sure, sir. Sergeant Walsh. Tell me out, Sergeant. You still got that tenant treasurer with you? Yes, sir. He's looking the pictures over, trying to pick out those two bandits. All right, Sergeant. I'll be right in. Okay, Lieutenant. Well, Mr. Lewis, this will be the last batch you'll have to look through today. Oh, that's good, Sergeant. I have to be at work at once. I can come back tomorrow if you want. Well, we'll see. Just go through those pictures. Take a good look at each one of them, both profile and front view. Uh-huh. If any of those men look familiar, just let me know. I sure will. And just take your time, huh? Okay. Well, uh, it's not this one. Yeah, that's all. Oh, come in, Lieutenant. How's it going, Sergeant? Not too well. Mr. Lewis, Lieutenant Niehaus. Mr. Lewis? Hello, Lieutenant. You go right ahead, Mr. Lewis. You sure? If I recognize any of them, I'll holler. Yeah, fine. Looks like a new bunch, huh, Sergeant? Well, he's been through the entire modus operandi file. He, he can't make anybody we've ever handled for robbery. What's he looking at now? Oh, mugs. Hey, that I... Yeah. Did you hit one, Mr. Lewis? Oh, I thought I did. No, this ain't him, I'm sure. Uh, okay, keep looking. Yeah, I will. Yes, Lieutenant, I think we're in for a siege from these boys. Well, let's keep at it, Sergeant. They're new at the game. At least they're up against a couple of old-timers. We've got them on that anyway. But what's the matter with going to the Pines, Rich? At least they got some music there you can dance to. I told you, Stud's going to meet us here. And I can't think of a better reason for leaving. Listen, Francie, get the chip off your shoulder. We're not going to be any good unless we're a team. Remember that. Ra, 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 team, team, team. 
You watch that most of the drink. Well, as long as I've got a choice, I think. Uh uh, party spoiled. Hello, Rich. Everything set. Sit down, Stan. I'm fine. How are you? I'm suddenly sick. Come on, come on. What did Bailey have to say? Well, he didn't exactly go for it like Romeo went for Juliet. That's a nice tie you got on, Stud. Is it new? <laughs> Pure silk. I just bought it this afternoon. It's class, huh? It was a little longer. You could hang yourself. Why, with you good oh. Jay? Cut it out. What did Bailey say? Well, Rich, he said he never looked at it that way. He didn't think chain grocery stores would be the ticket. And he got suspicious. But you told him there'd be lots of dough in those things. Yeah, but a guy's always suspicious when he gets something for nothing. For you to case 15 or 20 of those stores, a big job, Rich. Especially for free. He wants to know what you're going to get out of it. You told him? Yeah, I told him. I laid it on the line. I told him that after he knocks over so many chain store safes, they'll stop keeping the dough in the safes. And that's when you start your end. And he went for it. But he was still a little suspicious, Rich. I had to promise him something. What? I had to promise him that when he broke into those stores, I'd go along. Just for the ride, huh? Well, if I'm going to do the work or take my split, you know how it is, Rich. Sure, sure. I know how it is. And it's okay? You got to take your pick, Stud. I bet Bailey's end or mine. I'll take his end. You're just playing a hunch. Maybe they'll take it out of the safe. Maybe they won't. Okay, Stud. I guess you know best. Thanks, Rich. I knew you wouldn't kick. You can do what you like. Only don't come running to me when I get started. I'll be satisfied. Well, I think I'll go call Bailey and say that you put the okay on it. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll be right back. What have you drink? Yeah, strychnine and soda. How do you like that guy? What do you have to be so nice about it for? He just walked out on the team. Rah, 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 team. That's all right, Francie. He leaves everything for you and me. Now, tomorrow, you got to start shopping for groceries, baby. In chain stores. Wait a... Wait a over here. So, Don, the criminal rich engineered a queer plan to set other criminals off on a series of chain grocery store safe burglaries in St. Louis. Now, if you're puzzled how he could profit from burglaries committed by other criminals, you'll see shortly that he had quite an ingenious plan... But he didn't realize that detectives also live by ingenuity. Now back to gangbusters. You were telling us, Chief Murphy, that the young criminal Rich convinced another gang that they could profitably burglarize the safes of chain grocery stores in St. Louis. And he even went so far as to have his girl Francie case the stores for them. That's right, Don. And soon police reports began to show a plague of these safe burglaries. A chain grocery store was broken into and its safe cracked nearly every night. St. Louis detectives were doing all they could to catch the criminals, but decided, as Rich hoped they would, that precautionary measures were also necessary. Lieutenant Niehaus and Sergeant Walsh were discussing the situation at police headquarters. Three o'clock, be all right with you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Got them all lined up, have you? Yes, sir. All the district managers, A&P stores, Kroger's, Piggly Wiggly, and one or two others. But, Lieutenant, do you really think they'll go for it? I don't see why not. They want to stop these burglaries. The best way to do it, next to catching the thieves, is not to leave anything for them to take if they do break in. Yeah, but some of these stores take in three or four thousand a day, Lieutenant. No matter what kind of trouble we've been having, it's still a sight easier to break into a manager's home than a store safe. Yes, it is. But the burglars won't know the store managers are carrying the money home with them. They won't know where it went. So no publicity on this move. No publicity at all. Pardon me. Yes, madam? You're the manager, aren't you? Yes. Can I help you? I'd like to get a check cashed, if I may. Oh, I'm sorry, madam. Company rules were not allowed to cash checks. But I left home without any money. Well, I guess I'll have to go back. Well, if you'd like, you can do your marketing now, and we'll hold the packages for you. No, I think I'll run on home, but... Well, it seems sort of silly rule not to cash customers' checks. If you cashed checks, you wouldn't have lost so much money in that robbery you had the other night. Maybe you're right, but there won't be any more money lost to burglaries. They haven't caught the criminals. No, not yet. But if they try it again, they'll find an empty safe. As a matter of fact, they try it in any of our stores, they'll find the safe empty. Really? Well, <laughs> thanks just the same. Hello? Rich? Yeah, Francie, how'd it go? 
The stores have stopped keeping their receipts around at night. Uh-huh. Then the managers must be taking it away with them. Check a few more places around closing time. Okay, General. And if that's the way it is, I'll go to work. Hey, uh, just a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. The store's closed tonight. Well, in that case, give me the dough. Well, what do you mean? Come on, buddy. I'm the collector. Get him up. Okay. Get him up. Please, don't you... I'll take that package. Give it to hell, I said. No, you oh. can't. No. Thanks, buddy. Well, I just put out an alarm on that last one, Lieutenant. Good. Lieutenant, I wish we could provide an armed guard for every chain store manager in the city. Where are we going to get the men? I don't know. You know, Sergeant, I can't help feeling that these robberies and safe burglaries are tied up in some way. It's just too neat to be a coincidence. Mm, maybe, but safe burglars and stick-up men just don't run together, Lieutenant. Mm. Uh, what about the stolen goods angle? Not much yet. Those burglars must know that cigarettes are just about as hard to trace as money. I guess that's why they went to the trouble to take them along. At least cigarettes are harder to conceal. Well, we're keeping our eye on receivers of such merchandise. Okay. I only hope it comes through before every store in town is touched. Hey, you know what's in here, Rich? Spaghetti. No kidding. Uh-huh. Imagine, the stuff is hard when you buy it. Yeah. Just goes to show if you nose around enough, you'll learn plenty. Yeah, well, there must be something you around here that's quick to fix. Oh, take your pick. I got two closets full of groceries. Ready to go in business myself. Uh, apple juice, tomato juice, sauerkraut juice, grapefruit juice, anything. Oh, there's chow mein. Hey, imagine chow mein in cans. Who's that? Not somebody with more groceries, I hope. Go out and take a look. Oh, sure. Yeah? Who is it? Come on, Francie, open up. Oh, I knew it was too good to last. Hello, Francie. Come in, come in. Is Rich around? Hey, Rich, come on out. You got lots of company. Hart, Schaffner, and Mark. Hello, Rich. Well, Stud, where'd you spring from? I hear you're doing all right, Rich. Well, I hear you're doing all right. We were until they didn't leave the dough in the safes anymore. It worked out like you figured. I'll bet you're happy, too. Look, Rich, if you uh, had to get a spot for me. A spot? You should have stayed with me all the while, Stud. You've been rolling in clover now. I guess I would have, but I'm flat. Flat? You guys must have taken plenty out of those safes. Yeah, but there were four of us. It was all right. Well, what happened to the dough? You know, a few clothes. Only a few? Hmm. And I dropped a bundle across the river. Haven't you got sense enough to stay out of a crack game? Oh, yeah, now, yes. How about it, Rich? You take me back in. If you do, Rich, I swear I... Haven't you got anything with? No dough. What then? Well, I, I got two cases of cigarettes we took out of one joint. What do you say, Rich? <laughs> Nothing to him. But, Rich, you... You were... had your chance to think and you didn't. What do you want, charity? Okay. That's the way you feel about it. Get rid of those cigarettes. They ought to bring you a hundred or so. Yeah, I guess I'll have to. But be careful where you sell them. Don't worry. Well, thanks just the same. Put some of your suits in, Hawk. They ought to keep you for a month. I did already. How oh, so long? Take it easy. There goes my pal. He's a bum. A bum with shoulder pads. Yeah. Maybe I should have taken him back. Are you losing your mind? Whenever he gets picked up for anything, he'll holler from here to St. Joe. Ah, who's going to pick him up? Nobody, I guess. But only I hope he's careful about getting rid of those cigarettes. They involve too many people. Lucius. Huh? Oh, sir. Hold on, sir. Just a minute, just a minute. Let me see. What are you doing? Figuring out your income tax? Your inventory, my boy. Just inventory. It's on your mind, sir. Busy today. Very busy. Look, Lucius. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm a little short of cash. Well, I'm not so long on it myself, my boy. Not long at all. I wasn't asking for a loan. It's a good thing. Because you wouldn't get it. You wouldn't get it. Could you use some cigarettes? Stud, you know I don't smoke. Quit years ago. Come on, Lucius. Cigarettes. How many you got? How many? Two cases. Old goals, both of them. There's not much of a market for cigarettes these days, Stud. 
Not much. When you're buying something, there's never much of a market, is there, Lucius? Well, it's the risk, sir. It's the risk. Where'd you get them? I got them. Isn't that enough? Forty dollars for the two cases. Forty dollars. Forty. There's a hundred cartons there. Forty dollars, sir. They're a thief, Lucius. Maybe. Maybe I am. Forty dollars. Okay. Where you got these cigarettes? Where? They're out in the car. Oh, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Let's get them. Um, you got the forty? That I'm surprised at you. Come on. Yeah. Where's Rich these days? I haven't heard from him in quite a time. Quite a time. Oh, he's a big shot now, Lucius. He don't deal in nothing but cash now. It's too bad. Which is the car? It's the convertible there. Nice, nice. Where'd you get it? I borrowed it. Oh, come on, come on. The cigarettes. They're in the trunk. Forty bucks ain't much money, Lucius. More than you got. <laughs> you get the point. There they are. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get them inside. Come on, the forty bucks, Lucius. Oh, yes, forty dollars. Well, uh, tens do? Anything. Ten, twenty, thirty, forty. Thanks. Inside. Inside with it. You take the other. Okay. Come on, come on. Wait till I shut the trunk. Forty bucks. Well, the market is bad, Stud. Very bad. All right, you two. That's far enough. Cops. Drop those cartons. Oh, please. Drop them. See here, officer. I'm a legitimate businessman. Legitimate. Your record says different. You... Where'd you get those cigarettes? What do you think? They fell off some truck. I see here, Captain. I'm, I'm not a captain, and you're under arrest receiving stolen property. Stolen property? Those cigarettes were taken in a burglary. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. What burglary? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anything about any burglary. Well, we'll see how much you know about burglaries, and also a few robberies. Come on, both of you. I see here. I said come on, and I mean it. Honest, Rich, I just can't sit here and listen to you cry in your beer all night. Well, I'm telling you, Francie, I made a mistake turning Scud out. I should have taken him back. I've got a feeling. I've got a feeling, too. I've got a feeling it ain't Christmas. If you took him back in, that's exactly what it would have to be, Christmas. Francie. What? We're getting out of town. For crying out loud, why? And to where? Who cares? Any place. Get back tonight. We're leaving in the morning. Okay, Admiral, you got a passenger. Then come on, let's get out of here. Well, not so fast. Let me finish my drink. All right, but make it snappy. Yes? Sergeant Walsh, Lieutenant. I just put this stud character back in the holdover. Did you get what you wanted? Everything. He sang like a soprano with a mint. We'll want to make simultaneous pickups tonight. I'll need a few squads. All right, Sergeant. Take anybody you want. Uh, do you want to come along, Lieutenant? Yeah, if you're short-handed. Well, it's not exactly that, Lieutenant. There's one of these birds I want to collar myself. A guy named Rich. He's the one that had this brainstorm, and I figured you'd like to be in on it, too. By all means, Sergeant. I want to be among the first to meet this rich. Okay. Hold it here, Stan. Yeah. Now, which door is it? It's that one there, the second one. Myers, Klein. All right. On past the room. Yes, sir. Telling Kraft. Yes, sir. Stick at the head of the stairs. Okay. You set, Lieutenant? Let's go. Go on, Stan. I said, go on. Okay, you don't have to shut me. You stop at the room, knock on the door, and say it's you. Now, look, I gave you guys to do like you're told. Okay. Knock. Go ahead, knock. All right. Now, when they ask who it is, you'll answer them, and then get back out of the way. Sure, the rent, Sergeant? I hope so. Knock again. Yeah, who is it? Go ahead. Answer. Who is it? It's me, Stud. Oh, it's Stud. Okay, just a second. Get back there, Stud. Stud, on it. Police officer. Well, there he is. Hey. Don't move, Rick. Hey, you don't take. Watch him, there's a gun on the rest. Right. Ow. You grab him. Now, there's no sense in crying about him, sister. The two of you will be separated for a long time. For good, I guess. 
But Don, that was how the young bandit with an idea learned the police also have ideas. Rich and all his accomplices were taken in custody. Subsequently, he was sentenced to a term of 12 years in the Missouri State Penitentiary. Well, thank you, Chief Murphy, for this absorbing case history. And gangbusters, congratulations to the police officers who rounded up this troublesome gang of criminals. Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett. It's not the whole story of Davy Crockett. I don't think anyone could do that because Davy Crockett is a legend. A legend as powerful and colorful and exciting as the legend of America itself. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first, America looks up to her men in the sky. Yes, our country looks up to the young men thundering their way to new glory in the skies. Theirs is a task held in high esteem by the entire nation. You are needed to swell their ranks and can do so by enrolling now in the Aviation Cadet Training Program of the United States Air Force. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, have had two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and ask about the Aviation Cadet Training Program. Do it today. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Davy Crockett, American. Davy Crockett was one of the most colorful and romantic characters that enlivened our American past. It's natural to link his name with the Alamo, for it was there he fought and died with that gallant little band of Texans. But up until that fateful day, Davy Crockett led an exciting and eventful life. Soldier, hunter, writer, statesman, humorist, and orator. There was little he didn't try his hand at. Let's travel back to the time of Davy Crockett. The time he went down the Red River on a steamboat to Nagadochus. All right, all right. Step right up, gentlemen. Step right up. Let's see if the hand is quicker than the eye. Now watch the thimble. Watch them carefully. All right. Under which thimble lies the beast. Hey, you there, stranger. Can you tell me? Why, why, sure. That one right there. Why, stranger, you got the eyes of a cougar. <laughs> come on, come on now, try again. Now, focus your gleaming orbs. Watch careful, like. Now, which one? Uh, well, that one there. Well, I'm totally flabbergasted. <laughs> stranger, I ain't never seen the likes of you. Now, what do you say we make a sport? A uh, shilling? Well, uh... I don't mind if I do. All right, now, here we go. Watch close now. Watch close. All right, uh, what about you, stranger? Want to take a chance? I never gamble, sir. Principled against it. Oh, I see. Well, well, them last sentiments were not, but this is not gambling by no means. A little innocent pastime, nothing more. Uh, near clean me out. Ah, now, stranger, just because you lost the light in them cougar eyes of yours, don't blame Carlton Thimble Rig for your misfortune. <laughs> well, well, what about it, sir? What'd you say? Take a trifle? Uh, I don't care how small. Just for the fun of the thing, huh? Well, I'm principled against betting money. But I don't mind going in for dinner for the present company. I'm hungry as a wolf in a blizzard. Well, sir, I admire your principles. And to show that I play with these here thimbles just for the fun of it, I'll take that bet. 
Either one or t'other of us is going in to stand to feed for this here group. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just say when, stranger. Now. Now? Bean is under the middle thimble. Hold there. I'll lift the thimble. Well, sir, well, sure enough, you've won the bet. But I don't care if I give you another chance. Even though I'm a whole hog temperance man, we'll make it drinks for all present. I'm sure you'll win. Then you're a darn fool to bet. Since that's the case, it'd be a little better than picking your pocket. So I let it alone. Well, now, I don't mind running the risk. But I do. Since I always let well enough alone, I've had enough glory for one day. Let's all go to the table. Eat at your expense. Yeah! Uh, say, uh, stranger, might I uh, ask your name? You might. I'm Colonel David Crockett, Tennessee. Yeah! Well, now I'll be struck by lightning and rolled in a keg of barbecue. <laughs> Friends, then we're here. Guess what I call a fine meal. Oh, thanks. When you can eat the way we all have and not have to pay for it, that's a mighty fine meal. Uh, now, we owe it all to you. Well, Colonel, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Kind of rests uneasy in my stomach, though. Maybe get your pocketbook mixed up with your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> well, poorly. That's how I feel. Poorly. Gentlemen! Gentlemen! Gentlemen, can I have your attention for a moment? Gentlemen, in just a few minutes, we're going to put in the Caspiana. Now, I got a score to settle in this alligator den. And I can use the help of any man who's got snake blood in his veins and welcomes a little tussle. Well, I'm glad to see you're all a crew of roarers. Now, the reason for my teeth is this. Last time down the river I put in to Caspiana, sent one of my men ashore to buy provisions. Well, the good citizens there beat him most severely and robbed him completely. Yeah, I was unable to repay them at the time for their gesture. And now, with your gallant help, I hope to return their kindness. Yeah. You got any particular plan, Captain? No, Colonel ain't. Just thought we might quite naturally take the town apart. Well, surely, the whole town can't be to blame for the treatment of your crewmen. That's true enough, Colonel. The whole thing took place at the Silver Bear. Stands right plumb on the river's edge. Worst den of the devil this side of the Mississippi. Well, why don't we hold our little party right there? Then innocent folks won't be getting trampled underfoot. That's agreeable to me. Captain, we're pulling in. All right, boys, let's get out on deck. Take her in close. Looks like they got some idea what we got in mind. Look at them up! They're locking themselves up in there like a pack of weasels. Yeah, we'll get them out and we have to burn them out. All right, hold her up! Captain, I got an idea. Them fellas will be hard to take. Some of your passengers might get hurt. Colonel, we're going to tear that place apart stick for stick. Now, don't get wolfish around the head, Captain. You see them two pillars in the front of the place? I do, and I'm going to break them with my bare hands. Suppose, instead of doing that, you was to put that heavy chain you got there around both of them. And then suppose you was to back your steamboat out of here for all she was worth. What do you suppose might happen? Well, now, if that ain't the prettiest thought ever did hear. Colonel, you're plumb spectacular. Well, I just figure the Silver Bear needs cleaning out. What better way of cleaning it out than to drag it into the river? (laughs) (laughs) Colonel, it's a pleasure to have you on board. Now listen, you roars. The Colonel's got a little ID. Well, I guess we're all ready to begin. I'll have the crew take the chain and put it around the pillars. Captain, this was my idea. Seems only natural I should go with him and see everything turns out correctly. Go ahead, Colonel. I gotta go, too. You boys, pick up that 
chain and do like the colonel tells you. If you need help, we'll come and run it. Forward, you snapper! Now, boys, you just make that chain fast around both them pillars. The rest of us will stand right here and see to it that the inmates of this doomed establishment remain within. Right, strangers! You come any closer and we'll come carry it a bit. Hey, you show your ugly jaw, we'll make a drinking horn out of it. All right, hurry it up now, boys. What's the idea on this, stranger? We ain't harmed you. We ain't spoiling for a fight. Well, we are, so stay in there. That's good work, friend. Now, let's get back to the ship. Fight, I'll admire. We may be making history here today. Belay, friend, belay. My fireman's got to hear my command, so I'll be pleased if you save your throat till after we've had a try at it. Now, Colonel, since this was your ID, why don't you give the command? Why, Captain, I'd be honest. All right, Colonel, whenever you're ready. Go ahead! Liberty and independence, fire! Become a wet goose. Well, my rig, I'm glad you've decided to give up gambling and come along with me. Colonel, after what you did, I'd take it a pleasure to go anywhere with you. Well, we'll be off for Nacogdoches in the morning. I ain't never hunted buffalo before. Ought to be some sport. Yeah. Hey, speaking of sport, looks like the fight on down the street. Well, let's go. Never like to miss one. I say you're an infernal scoundrel on your hair. I do, but it's news to me. Hey, I know that, Whooper. I met him in New Orleans. That's the bee hunter. Well, you distinctly call me a cat. If you insist upon it, you may. You hear, gentlemen? You hear the insult? What shall I do with this scoundrel? Well, I'll do it once. Come one step this way, you rascal, and I'll flog you within an inch of your life. I've no occasion. You're a coward. Not on your word. I'll prove it by flogging you out of your skin. I doubt it. I'm a liar, then, am I? Just as you please. You hear that, gentlemen? <laughs> oh, heaven, grant me patience. I shall fly out of my skin. It'll be so much the better for your pocket. Cash, skins, and good demand. I shall burst! Not here in the street, I beg you. That'd be disgusting. <laughs> Gentlemen, I can no longer avoid flogging them. <laughs> Now, I suggest you put him under the pump where he can cool off. <laughs> now, bee hunter, you ain't changed none. I see no reason for it, Symbol Rig. How you been? Oh, like a wild horse. Uh, want you to meet a friend of mine. Well, Colonel Crockett, it's a pleasure to know you, sir. How'd you know it was the Colonel? Well, I heard you was in town. Heard you were going to Nacogdoches. I, uh... Thought you might let me ride along with you. I know the way, middle and well. Why, we'd be glad to have you come along with us. The trails are mighty dangerous these days. How so? A band of murdering renegades has been raising hair from here to Texas. Well, since nobody else has seen the critters, maybe we get the chance. Now, Colonel, that's a possibility that stirs my liver. Well, now, that reminds me of a man. <laughs> You are listening to the proudly we hail production, Davy Crockett, American. Our story will continue in just a moment after this important message. Young men of America, your country is building a mighty air force to maintain the security of our nation. This means that there is a job for you. The chance to do an important job with one of the finest organizations of its kind in the world today, the United States Air Force. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, have had two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified... The Air Force needs you as part of the Aviation Cadet Training Program. For complete details, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. 
You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now we present the second act of Davy Crockett, American. I'd like to have a little wife, I reckon I know who. I'd like to have a little son, a little daughter, too. Mm-hmm. Ah, that sure is a romantic song, B. Hunter. What you looking at, Colonel? Buzzard. You can just make them out. Circle. Yeah, probably a dead buffalo. I think we'd better have a look. Come on. I've seen some bad sights. We'd this... only come a little sooner. We might have helped. Won't do any good to figure that way. Best thing to do now is we bury these poor folks. Try and follow the trail of the murdering devils that did this. Yeah. We're only a day away from Nagadosis. We ride hard, we can get there sooner. We could rouse out some friends that got there and track these critters into the ground. I'm for doing it ourselves. I know we're all of the rhinoceros breed, but the bee hunter's right, Timberley. There'll be too many for us. Let's go see some of your friends in Akadokis. <laughs> You and Thimble Rig get better down here for the night, and I'll go on and see the sheriff. Sounds reasonable. Hadn't we all better see him? Oh, no, that won't be necessary. Besides, he's he got a daughter named Kate, and I'm kind of burning to see her. <laughs> Colonel, I think we ought to go along to make sure he doesn't set fire to the house. Oh, <laughs> we'll trust him. See you tomorrow, boy. Yeah. Come on, huh? Evening, stranger. What you got in the way of lodging for a couple of tired alligators? Good evening, sir. I don't exactly recollect your name. Well, it's no consequence. We just like... I'm pretty sure I've seen you somewhere, both of you. Traveling to the western country, I presume. Presume anything you please, but don't trouble us with your presumption. Oh, no offense, no offense, sir. I wouldn't be thought uncivil by any means. I always calculate to treat everyone with civility. Well, treat us all by answering our first question. Well, I can't give you lodging without knowing who you are. Oh, you can, can't you? Well, I'll tell you who I am right enough. I'm shaggy as a bear. Wolfish about the head, active as a cougar, and can grin like a hyena till the bark will curl off a gum log. There's a sprinkling of all sorts in me, from the lion down to the skunk. And if you don't hurry up and give me and the colonel a place to bed down... I'll guarantee you pronounce me an entire zoological institute before I'm through with you. You understand? Oh, dear, dear, yes. The colonel, you said. The colonel who? I'd like to have a little farm such scenes as these, where I could live without a care, completely at my ease. And is there nothing else you'd like to have to make you happy? Yes, there is, my gentle case. I'll tell you what it is. I'd like to have a little wife. I... Oh, hello, Colonel. Yeah, I... I have a feeling I'm interrupting. No, not at all. I... I want you to meet my Kate. I'm not your Kate. How do you do, Colonel? Edward's been telling me about you. <laughs> She's my Kate, Colonel, no matter what she says. Well, she is. You're a lucky man. Pleasure to meet you, ma'am. Colonel, I guess we got here just too late. The sheriff and about all the men in town are out hunting those devils. They wiped out some settlers south of here. Kind of riled everybody up. Well, I'm glad they're being chased after. Sorry we didn't get a chance to join in. Thimble Rig and I are off for Texas in the morning. You planning to join us? Well, I know the trail middling well. You ought to have somebody along who knows it. Middling well? Why, he knows every foot of it like the palm of his hand. He and his Indian friends go bee hunting all over this <laughs> oh, territory. Oh, you. 
You mustn't brag about me. We'll leave the tavern about sunup. You be there? I'll be there, Colonel. And we'll see you later. Thimble Rick just bought himself one of these new Vicksburg hats. Yes? <laughs> I had to see he don't get in any trouble with it. it. Does make him look a mite peculiar, I bet. Ma'am, it was a it was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Colonel. I um I hope you'll see that Edward stays out of trouble too. Ha <laughs> ha my Kate, my Kate, my wonderful Kate. <laughs> Oh, Kate was mine, and I was here, fiddly I O, fiddly I D. Uh, be sure to stop in on your way back, Colonel. Mr. Mudge, I'll do my best to avoid it. Fine, fine, I aim to please. Hey, be on there, come on! Now, 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 Timber Egg. Don't rush a man in love. But it's time we was on our way, Colonel. A few minutes one way or other won't matter to us. Here he comes. Wow! Ain't she pretty? You forgive him? Forgive her? <laughs> I think he's plumb out of his head to go anywhere without me. <laughs> Goodbye, friend. Bye. Goodbye. Just see you when he gets yeah, back. Goodbye. Goodbye. Saddled and bridled and booted rode he. A plume in his helmet, a sword at his knee. But, but home came the saddle, all oh, bloody to see. And home came the steed, but home never came he. How much further to the Sabine River? Another hour? Maybe a little less. Should pick up some buffalo signs soon. Of course, with that hat he's wearing, the buffalo probably all run right into the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> What's the matter with this hat? Well, I don't rightly know. It might not be the hat. It might be your head. Oh, be hunter. That ain't no way to talk. <laughs> I'm a truthful man, you ask me. Is that so, Colonel? That's so. What do you think of my hat, Colonel? I don't know if I could give an opinion, Thimble Rig. Why not? Well, it puts me in mind of that terrible cold winter we had a few winters back. Well, what's that got to do with my hat? Well, speak directly, Thimble Rig. It leaves me about that cold. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, Colonel, you hurt me bad. You hurt me awful bad. Now, oh, oh, boys, I think we better ride. Burn my old shoes if you ain't right. Yes, yeah, them all right. Must be nearly 50 of them skunks. I'd rather count them from a greater distance. Horse, pick up your feet. Two directly. All right, boys. Pick your man. Those three eager gorillas ought to be good for a starter. Fire! That's fair to middle and shooting. Three for three. We clipped their horns. We may have bent them a little. Probably made a matter in a hat full of rattlesnakes. I don't think it'll be long before they try their luck on us. Yeah, that was my feeling. How do you figure to get off here? We, we'll borrow a little trick from the angel. Get the horses into the river. Let them swim downstream. We'll hold on. Yeah. In the dark, if we is quiet, they won't see us. Good enough. Let's go before they change our mind. Too late! Here they come! Beauty 
I wondered for a while last night whether we was ever going to see it. By simple rig, that's an insult to the colonel and me. Now, didn't you know as long as we were there, you were as safe as a babe in his mother's arms? Well, of course, the sheriff and his boys showing up, that didn't help any, did it? Well, I think it added to the glory of the moment. Made it somewhat more noisy. Yeah, and let somebody clean up the mess we'd made. The colonel and I, that is. They're a couple of real low-down wild men, ain't you? Yeah! Listen to me, holler. I'm glad you recognize us for what we are, Thimble Rig. Of course, you know my own theory is, if you hadn't been wearing that pacifist hat, them poor souls might have let us go our way without any excitement. So I think the bee hunter here, and I owe you an apology. <laughs> it's a fine hat, Thimble Rig. A raven beauty of a hat. Yeah, it's a roost of a hat. A monumental monument to the glory of all hats. Well, gentlemen, I must judge you sorely. And for that, I take off this flaming headpiece of joy to which you refer and bow. Well, since it's off, Thimble Rig, why not leave it off until we uh, find those buffaloes? <laughs> Oh, I love my Kate, and my Kate loved me. None so fair did I ever see. And so off they rode, Davy Crockett and his two friends, Thimble Rig and the Bee Hunter. Much befell them on the trail before the gates of the Alamo closed behind them. On the day before that little fort fell, Colonel Davy Crockett wrote these final words in his journal. Go ahead! Liberty and independence forever! Those words can mean everything or nothing, all depending on what you believe. To Colonel Davy Crockett, they meant everything, because he believed them and lived by them and finally died for them. Davy Crockett and men like him made up the past out of which we have grown. America is depending on her leaders in the air. If you're a young man between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, have had two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified... You are eligible to join the ranks of America's leaders in the air. You can become an aviation cadet. The defense of our nation hangs heavily on our air strength, the finest in the world. But we cannot relax our efforts. The Air Force still needs pilots and aircraft observers. If you have the primary qualifications, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. Ask about the aviation cadet training program. Do it now. has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, 
Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to talk about an adventure myself. An adventure in good eating. It begins with a good wine. Petri California Sauterne. You just serve that Petri Sauterne the next time you have fried chicken. Do you like fried chicken? Cooked so it's crispy and a beautiful reddish gold color on the outside and just, oh, just as tender as all get out on the inside. Ah, that's chicken. But where do you try it with Petri Sauterne? That's a wine. That Petri Sauterne is a pale, delicate, golden color. You can just look at it and you know it's going to be one of the most delicious wines you've ever tasted, if not the most delicious. Petri Sauterne is not only wonderful with chicken, it's, it's great with fish or any kind of seafood, too. Get a bottle of Petri Sauterne. When it's a Petri wine, it's a good wine. And now I'm sure Dr. Watson's expecting us, so let's go in and join him. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening. Drop your chair by the fire. That's it. The tobacco's in the jar beside you over there. Thanks. Well, Doctor, all ready for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Though on this occasion, I'm going to tell the story a little differently. You see, I didn't take part in it myself, so I shall act as a narrator and recount the adventure as it was told me some years after it actually took place. Told you by Sherlock Holmes, I suppose. Yes. At the time the story happened, the whole world, including myself, believed that my old friend had been dead for three years. What did he do with himself during those three years, Doctor? Wandered about the world, Persia, Egypt, the south of France, and two years of his time was spent in Tibet, where he disguised himself as a Norwegian explorer by the name of Sergison, his object being to visit the forbidden city of Lhasa. The story began as Holmes stood on the outskirts of a tiny encampment, high in the Tibetan snows, disguised as a Norwegian circus. Surrounding him was an excited group of, of native guides, their fur-capped faces and shaggy sheepskin coats, making them appear like strange, wild animals, as they stood there gesticulating wildly. The freezing wind whirled great clouds of snow away from the mountaintop that loomed above them. And Holmes told me that he felt a premonition of impending disaster. Stop! My men will go no further. They say the goddess of the mountain is angry. If we climb further, she will swallow us up. She will bury us. But we cannot go back now. We have come so far, a thousand feet, eight hundred feet higher. We shall reach the park. We shall be safe. I will not go! We can stay back there in the tent until the goddess of the mountain tells us we may go further. He is right. We can't go. We don't want to go anymore. It's too... Fools! If you stay here in the wilderness, in the village, and the avalanche comes, you will all be buried. You will be swept away. The only road lies upward. We will not go. Back to the tent. The wind is rising. was the only one who survived. He struggled up the pass that led to safety, the icy gale whipping round him in a, in a frenzy. A few moments after he reached the top, the avalanche occurred. The tents and the guides and all their equipment were buried beneath hundreds of feet of hurtling, thundering the snow. The way behind him was closed. He could only forge ahead. Alone, unaided, he descended the path that led to the plateau beyond. But the goddess of the mountain was still angry. Through the knifing wind and snow he battled on, without food and without, as he told me later, much hope. Even Holmes was helpless in that battle of man against the elements. What happened in that 36 hours, he never really knew, except that the wind howled and the driving snow slashed at him without mercy. Finally, his mind began to wander, and he became delirious. Watson, dear boy, hand me my violin, will you? Moriarty, I want to introduce you to the goddess of the mountain. I think you'll have a lot in common. 221 B Baker Street, Cabby, for heaven's sake, get me as fast as you can. I think I've caught a chill. Well, his 
mind was wandering, his great strength combined with instinctive urge for self-preservation must have kept him on his feet. But finally he returned to normal consciousness to find himself jogging along a rough road in a primitive cart drawn by two oxen. The sun shining on him and a white girl feeding him warm broth from a cup. For a moment the girl looked at him with a comforting smile and then she spoke. No wonder you look puzzled, poor man. You can't make up your mind whether you're in this world or the next. Who are you? And how did I get here, please? My name is Eileen Farley. I'm a medical missionary. I found you wandering out of your mind two days ago. And I've taken you under my wing. We're going to the monastery of Pancha Pushpa. I'm most grateful to you, Miss Farley. You have saved my life. Permit me to introduce myself. My name is Sigerson. Olaf Sigerson. I'm a Norwegian explorer. <laughs> Oh, no. No, your name is Sherlock Holmes, and you're a famous English detective. Please, I don't understand. You. Mr. Holmes, you've been delirious for the last two days. In your ravings, I was delighted to learn that the great Sherlock Holmes did not die two years ago at the Reichenbach Falls. I can see that further simulation is useless, my dear young lady. However, I must implore you to keep my secret. It's essential that for a while longer, the world continues to think me dead. You don't need to worry, Mr. Holmes. I'm a great admirer of yours, and I promise that no one will ever learn your secret from my lips. Try drinking a little more broth. You're right. dreadfully weak. Thank you so much. Help me, please. Please, to give me help. Another white man travels the road to Pancha Pushpa. Stop the cart. You need help? Ah! Ah, my own cart has broken the wheel. We're going, perhaps, to the monastery of Pancha Pushpa. We are. Ah, good. Pyotr Dmitrievich Borodin, Imperial Russian envoy, will travel with you. Uh, please to make room. Uh, as possible. Uh, remember my secret. And uh, the cart may proceed. Ponimoesh. Uh, your name, please, young lady. Eileen Farley. I'm an American medical missionary. Well, I do not approve of missionaries, but uh, you are very beautiful. So Borodin will forgive you. <laughs> Who is this magic lying on the floor? He looks half dead. I am half dead, Gospodin Borodin. My name is Sigerson. I am Norwegian. What is a Norwegian doing in Tibet? I have been exploring the mountains. And what, may I ask, is a Russian doing in Tibet, Gospodin Borodin? What is a Russian doing? <laughs> you shall see, my friend. To Holy Mother Russia shall belong Tibet. But now let us be gay. We have some hours ahead of us. You uh, like vodka, Miss Farley? I'm afraid I don't drink. <laughs> Borodin will teach you to drink. Then he will sing you songs of his native Russia. Uh, we shall be happy. Singing. <laughs> Holmes told me that every note jarred his aching, weary head. After a few hours, the strangely assorted trio arrived at the gates of the monastery. The edifice, as Holmes told me, of great antiquity and of breathtaking beauty, and built in the shadow of a giant mountain. He was fed and bathed, and shortly afterwards he found himself together with his two companions in the presence of the head abbot himself, a man of great age and infinite wisdom. The faint chanting of religious music could be heard coming from another part of the monastery. As the old man... <laughs> My dear Miss Farley, my dear gentlemen, I have welcomed you to the monastery, and yet each one of you has come to me separately and asked that he be given permission to go to the sacred city of Lhasa. I cannot give that permission, my children. Borodin has traveled a long way. Russia will be most unhappy if he does not get the permission. I am an explorer, Reverend Sir. Will not that fact entitle me to some consideration? I, too, have traveled a great way, sir. My children, I realize your claims, but the permission is not in my power to grant. Tibet is ruled by our Chinese overlords. In any case, I will ask you to turn your heads. The gentleman approaching us has preceded you in residence here. He also wishes to tread the road to Lhasa. You have you visited, I say. Yes, my son. Permit me to introduce you. Sir Harvey Forrester, and this is Miss Eileen Farley. How do you do? How do you do, Sir Harvey? Gospodine Borodin from Russia. 
How do you do? One cannot travel the world without meeting an Englishman. Good way, Pushy Watsi. And Mr. Olaf Siegerson from Norte, Gordak Sahar. How do you do? Please be seated. My children, the Chinese ruler in this province has heard of your presence here. He has announced his intention of visiting you. Before he arrives, I should like to ask you each a question. Four of you, all from different countries, have traveled here to the mountains of Tibet. At this monastery, I can offer you refreshment, the opportunity of acquiring wisdom and peace. What more do you seek in Lhasa? I shall ask you each that question in turn. You, Miss Farley, what do you seek? I seek the opportunity to bring both God and health to your Tibetan people. And you, Mr. Seekerson? I seek to chart the true course of your mountains, and so to bring knowledge to the world. And you, Gospodin Borodin? I seek to bring about complete understanding between the great peoples of Tibet and Russia. If I succeed, the Tsar and his family may consider turning to Buddhism. Indeed. And you, Sir Harvey, as representative of the British government, what do you seek? I shall not join in this contest of wishful thinking. I merely remind you, sir, that your government has signed a treaty with mine. And was not that treaty forced upon us by our Chinese overlords? No, my children. You have advanced brave reasons, but I cannot help remembering that the streams of Tibet bear gold nuggets the size of hazelnuts. You foreigners, in your pitiful ignorance, esteem gold. That signals the arrival of Hua Tsun, the Chinese emissary. Your problems will soon be settled, my children. I will acquaint him with your request. Mm. Why are you smiling, Mr. Holmes? At the name of the Chinese overlord, Hua Tsun. Must avoid falling into old habits and saying, Elementary, my dear, Hua Tsun. He's going to speak. Silence! Silence! The abbot has told me your wishes. I will hold conference. American lady and Norwegian will not be allowed. Only Great Britain and Russia have treaties with my country. I insist that I have prior right over the Russian representative. Good wars, man. I represent the Tsar. And Russia is your neighbor. I demand my diplomatic privilege. Follow me. I will decide these things. Not you. I shall inform the British Consul in Peking if This is an insult to the Tsar. Call him on the Russia will never... Well, Mr. Holmes, yes. it looks as if you and I, at any rate, don't get to Lhasa. No. You look worried. Does the journey to Lhasa mean so much to you? It isn't that. I'm worried about the potential danger that hangs over this monastery. Violent forces are at work. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? As you know, Miss Farley, I have some specialized acquaintance with these matters, and I tell you that I have rarely seen more clearly exemplified that emotional tension which leads to one thing. Murder. That is what I'm afraid of, young lady. Murder. That was what Holmes was afraid of. Later that day, as the sun was setting over the mountaintop, the old abbot walked slowly in the monastery garden as he talked to the man who he thought would be Seekerson. Mr. Seekerson, what can I do to help you? Our conversation has pleased me. You are a man of rare perception and knowledge. I grant you one worthy to enter, Lhasa, but I can offer no hope. Mr. Wa has already rejected the applications of both the Englishman and the Russian. He did that. He did, my son. He told me they were both very angry and threatened him. If anything were to, uh, to happen to the Chinese emissary, would you have the right to grant permission for the journey to Lhasa? Yes, until the new envoy arrived from Peking. But what are you suggesting, my son? This monastery is a haven of peace, a backwater far from the troubled stream of life. No violence has ever occurred here. I hope it never will, and yet the Chinese envoy was frightened, you say, Reverend Sir? Yes, my son. He has left the monastery, of course. No, those who come here even for a short visit must break bread with us and sleep at least one night. Mr. Wa is quartered in the cell you see before. Then do you mind if we call on him, Reverend Sir? Of course not, my son. Though you will but waste your breath in talking to him. He will not give you permission to take the road to Lhasa. He sleeps, my son. 
Let us not disturb him. If you don't mind, the Reverend, sir, I must waken him. If he can be wakened. What can be wrong? I think I know. I'm going in. There is your answer, Reverend, sir. He is dead? Yes, sir. Strangled with his own cue. Oh, the poor misguided man has taken his own life, my sir. No, sir. Look at those marks on his shoulder. He has been murdered. But what are we to do? As it happens, Reverend, sir, I've had a certain amount of experience with these matters in my, in my own country. If I were to produce the murderer for you with certain proof of his guilt... Would you authorize my going to Lhasa? Yes, since for a few days that permission is mine to give, I will grant it. You fill me with a strange confidence. But how will you find this taker of life? I can't tell you now, sir, but I shall find him. All that I require is a little assistance from you, sir. Of course. What is it? Let us both leave this cell. Post guard here and give him strict orders that no one is to enter and is accompanied by me. Very well. But, my son, where are you going? Before very long, sir. I hope to be on my way to Lhasa. Dr. Watson will tell us the rest of his story immediately, so I'll just take a second to remind you that hamburgers, yep, hamburgers, are practically an all-American food. We all love a good hamburger, but wait till you taste a juicy hamburger together with a glass of Petri California Burgundy. Boy, that Petri Burgundy is a hearty red wine that's just the best friend a hamburger or steak or any kind of meat dish ever had. So remember, if you want a red wine for dinner, you want Petri Burgundy. If you prefer a white wine, you want Petri Sauterne. And if you can't make up your mind which you want, it's simple. Don't buy one, buy two. But always buy Petri. P-E-T-R-I. Petri. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that Sherlock Holmes was in a tough spot. There he was, thousands of miles from England, a murderer was running loose, Holmes was in disguise, and he hadn't got you to help him on the case. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bartell. I must say, I think that I always was useful to my old friend, but I, I wasn't there. So this time he enlisted the services of Eileen Farley, the American girl. Immediately after he'd left the cell of the murdered man, he'd gone to Miss Farley and told her of the tragedy. As I returned to the scene of the crime... He found that his instructions had been carried out and that a guard was barring the entrance to the dead man's cell. There's a guard in front of the cell. My instructions. The abbot gave you your orders. Yes, you may go in. Please close the door behind us. I'm sure your nerves are up with this, Miss Farley. It's not a pretty sight. I've seen sudden death before, Mr. Holmes. In any case, I wouldn't dare appear frightened. I'm so flattered that you asked me to help you. You were the only one who knew my true identity. That's why I suggested you take my old friend's place. I need, what shall I say? I needed uh, a sounding sound board for my deductions. Wait a minute, here. I'll light a match. There we are. Now, here's a candle. <gasps> oh! I warned you it wasn't a pretty sight. Hold the candle, will you please, Miss Barney? Thank you. <sighs> this isn't hard to reconstruct. Killer stood behind his victim, held him by the left shoulder. So, wound his cue around his neck and pulled back. Yes, yes. The marks are self-evident. Hello. What's this on the floor? His feet. A cigarette. Dropped as it was burning, I should think. And now it's nothing but ash. Exactly, ash. Now, which of the visitors at the monastery smoke cigarettes? Uh, yourself, the Russian, and Sir Harvey, the Englishman. I think we may justifiably omit myself from the list of suspects, so that narrows us down to two. Look, Miss Harley. What is it? There are clear traces here to the naked eye, not only of tobacco, ash, and paper, but of... A cardboard. But what does that signify, Mr. Holmes? The case is nearly solved. Come on, young lady. We must pay a visit to Borodin's cell at once. Arguments. Always, Sir Harvey Forrester, you give me the argument. But my dear Borodin... I am not your dear Borodin. I'm Pietro Dimitrovich Borodin, ambassador of Holy Mother Russia. I'm no friend of yours. <laughs> Come in, come in, come in. Ah, huh. the missionary girl and the sick Norwegian. Come in. We will drink vodka, and I will sing Russian songs for you. We haven't come here to listen to songs. The Chinese envoy was murdered tonight. Ah, so we have been told, my dear. 
Sir Harvey and I are very happy because of his death, are we not? Well, I won't pretend I'm hot, Rodin. What is it, Norwegian? You were in the cell tonight at the time of the murder. Huh? That's a lie. I can prove it. In that cell, I've just found ashes, a totally burned cigarette, ashes that included fragments of cardboard. Only a Russian cigarette has a cardboard mouthpiece. What you can or cannot prove is of no interest to me, Sigerson. He's very obstinate tonight, Sigerson. We've just been having a political argument. Couldn't agree on a single point, except on the danger of the common man. He was telling me of the most extraordinary revolution in his estates. Do you know they chopped off one of his hands? <gasps> Your hand borrowed in. Which, which one? Uh, as God was merciful, uh, my left hand. And the one beneath your glove? Is made of wax, my good Norwegian. Is made of wax. Mercy for yourself. Extraordinary. It's more than that. It is conclusive proof. What do you mean, Mr. Seagull? I cannot tell you now. I must leave you here. Let me warn you, the three of you will be well advised to keep an eye on each other. Meanwhile, I must see the abbot. Why, Mr. Seagull? Because now I know who murdered Vatsun. of dawn are stealing across the mountain top, my son. Soon you will be on your way to Lhasa. Yes, Reverend Sir. You have kept your promise. You kept yours, Mr. Sigerson. The Chinese soldiers have arrived and the taker of life has been given into their custody. Before you leave, my son, I want you to do something for me. Anything, Reverend Sir. What is it? The hooded figure in the corner is that of the monastery scribe. He keeps our annals. I want you to explain for our records how you knew which one of the three was the taker of life. It was not difficult, sir. The killer had gripped Vatsun's shoulder with the left hand while the right was used to strangle him. Therefore, the Russian Borodin could not be the killer since his left hand was artificial. Quite so. It was, as you told me, made of wax. Then, But the clue of the cigarette pointed directly to the Russian. Therefore, it had obviously been planted there deliberately to incriminate him. Now, there is no trained police force in Tibet. We need no police. There is no crime here, my son. But continue. Why should the secret be planted to incriminate the Russian? Unless there was someone capable of making the deduction from a handful of cigarette ash. Therefore, the murderer was the one person who knew my true identity. Miss Eileen Farley, supposed missionary. No missionary. As it transpired when she confessed... And no American? No. The Secret Service agents of a Ameri- German origin seeking to reach Lhasa before the Russians. And I'm furiated by Batson's denial of passage. Any Secret Service is better off without such employee. She will pay for her mortal sins. May she redeem herself in her next place on the wheel. My son. Yes, Reverend Sir. You are about to leave me. And I shall never see you again. Though evil and death came to Panchapushpa and to my monastery in the caravan that brought you here, I shall miss you, my son. I shall miss you greatly. And I you, Reverend Sir. Would you consider staying here? I can only offer you peace, a shelter from the outside world, and quiet companionship. Ah, Three great gifts, sir. But I cannot take them. My work is not done. I must go on. Of course, my son. It was an old man's dream. One last question. What is it, sir? You spoke of your true identity just now. Who are you, my son? Reverend sir, I cannot tell even you the answer to that question. One day, perhaps, but not now. Let us just say that I have wandered through a world of trouble just as you have remained tranquil in a world of peace. I hope, sir, that we should meet again. I hope so, too. Goodbye, my son. Goodbye, Reverend, sir. Goodbye.
Doctor, that was really an unusual story. You told it so well, I, I felt you were actually a part of it. No, oh, my boy, as I said, the story was told to me by Holmes. I, I've never been to Tibet. Been to India, of course. I never really wanted to go to Tibet. Horrible mountains, terrible weather, lots of bandits on the roads. Sort of a dangerous place. Uh, doctor, you're not afraid of danger, are you? Ten years ago, Mr. Bartell, a question like that had been insult. Today I realize that all of us, unless we're stupid, have some fear of danger. I would say that I'm definitely not a coward, nor am I a thrill seeker, but uh, I've done with searching for, <laughs> for something new. Me too, Doctor. I'm through searching for something new also. Now that I've found Petri wine, I'm going to stick to it. Mr. Bartell, no matter what we talk about, when you say it, it always sounds like Petri wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? I can't think of a more delicious wine, and no wonder. The Petri family has been making the fine Petri wines for generations. Ever since the 1800s, they've handed on down from father to son, from father to son, the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, you can rest assured that the Petri family takes pride in doing a good job. They won't put that name Petri on any wine that isn't up to the high Petri standards. Yes, if it's Petri wine, you know it's good wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you plan to tell us next week? Well, now, uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a story that started off in a very light-hearted way and ended on the same note. And yet it involved Sherlock Holmes and myself in serious danger and caused us intense humiliation. I call it The Adventure of the Pigeon Feathers. It sounds swell, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And before you go, I want to remind the families of our returned veterans that their sons are more than heroes. They not only fought bravely, but in the armed forces they acquired new skills, learned or bettered themselves in some trade or furthered their education. Our men have returned with a new maturity and a new wisdom. They will be more valuable to past or to future employers and more valuable to their country. The greatest assets America has at this moment are her veterans. Remember that. Good night. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Empty House. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday night on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.